Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 U.S. Treasury Market Conference. My name is Michelle Neal. I am head of the markets group here at the New York Fed. Uh, and on behalf of the New York Fed and all my colleagues, um, and also our conference co-sponsors, which include the U.S. Department of Treasury, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Thank you all for coming today. We're delighted to be holding this conference together in person for the first time since 2019. So thank you for making the effort to be here in person. Today's event marks the eighth annual Treasury Market Conference. As we've often noted in this forum, the U.S. Treasury market is the deepest and most liquid securities market in the world. It plays a critical role in the global economy, serving as the primary means of financing the U.S. federal government, a significant investment instrument and hedging vehicle for global investors, a risk-free benchmark for other financial instruments, and an important market for the Federal Reserve's implementation of monetary policy. In today's agenda, we will be highlighting key developments, policy issues, and recent trends in the Treasury market, including recommendations and steps taken to improve market functioning and resilience. The New York Fed has a long history of convening market practitioners, policymakers, and academics to share insights and advance dialogue around critical market issues. So we're excited to host this conference today and engage in a discussion on important topics related to the U.S. Treasury market resilience. I'll now turn it over to my colleagues, Brian Smith and Rania Perry, um, who'll be emceeing today's conference. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, I'm Brian Smith, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Federal Finance at the Treasury Department. Um, today's conference will focus on key topics related to functioning and resilience of the Treasury market. We're delighted to have several keynote speeches and remarks lined up from senior officials across the joint member agencies, including New York Fed President John Williams, Treasury Undersecretary for Domestic Finance Nellie Lang, SEC Chair Gary Gensler, and CFTC uh, uh, Chairman Russ Benham. We'll also have three panel discussions with academics and industry leaders. The three panels will be moderated by Josh Frost, Treasury Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets, Nate Werfel, New York Fed Head of Domestic Markets, and Don Cohn, the RUSA Chair in International Economics at Brookings. These will cover a broad range of topics, including central clearing, all-to-all -all trading, and the appropriate role for the official sector versus the private sector in ensuring the resilience and liquidity of the Treasury market. And I'll turn it over to Rania Perry, who uh, I'll be sharing today's MC responsibilities with. Thank you, Brian. Hi, everyone. I'm Rania Perry. I'm the Director of the Treasury Markets Area here at the New York Fed. It's a pleasure to be joining you all again uh, today here in person for another one of our annual conferences. And um, I'm really looking forward to today's uh, event, and I hope there will be lively discussion. Um, uh, we'll be getting started very shortly, but first I'll go through a couple of uh, logistical um, matters for the day. So first, we'd like to remind everyone that um, uh, this uh, conference is on the record. We have members of the uh, press here with us today, so please uh, make note that anything that's said during the conference today um, uh, will be considered on the record unless otherwise noted. Um, also, we will be we are live streaming the conference on the New York Fed's public website, um, and uh, so it'll be available there if anyone else would like to watch from that point. Um, we'll be opening things up to audience Q&A at various points throughout the day. Um, we'll let you know when the Q&A sessions are about to happen. Uh, just please make sure to raise your hand, wait for a mic, and introduce yourself um, during that Q&A. Uh, and we really encourage uh, participation during those Q&A sessions. Uh, just in terms of other logistics, there's agenda and bio book for um, today's uh, participants um, that are, is available outside of the conference center, uh, as well as an area where you can check all your things um, during the day. We have three scheduled coffee breaks. They'll be available right outside here in the conference center. And then our luncheon and our reception will be downstairs in the Liberty Dining Room um, on the first floor right around where you checked in. Now, without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome John Williams as our first speaker of the day. He is the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a, role, a position he has held since 2018. 
As part of this role, he also serves as the vice chair and a permanent member of the Federal Market, Market Committee. Um, and before joining the New York Fed, he was president and CEO of the San Francisco Fed, um, a role he held uh, beginning in 2011. And prior to that, he was the director of research there. President Williams began his career as an economist at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. He also served as a senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors and as a lecturer at Stanford. Please join me in welcoming President Williams. Good morning, everyone. Let me add my welcome to everybody here in uh, person for this uh, really important uh, and valuable conference. Uh, we're excited to have you back in, in this room for the annual Treasury Market Conference. You'll notice we have a new look to our auditorium um, since you were probably last year in, in, in 2019 or earlier, and I hope you'll find it a comfortable space since we have a very busy day uh, ahead. I'm really looking forward to hearing the, the remarks and, and the discussions. Now. We all know that the topic of today's conference is the resiliency of the U.S. Treasury market. But before I get to that, I'd be remiss if I did not take this opportunity, and hopefully for the last time, to remind everyone that we are entering the final stretch of the transition away from the London Interbank Offered Rate, or LIBOR. So I'm pleased to report that that transition has been extremely successful so far, and it's really thanks to the significant and coordinated efforts from stakeholders across the globe. A real special shout out to the Alternative Reference Rates Committee, or ARC, for their outstanding work and dedication in guiding the move off of U.S. dollar LIBOR and promoting the adoption of more ro robust rates, like the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, or SOFR. They proved that LIBOR was far from irreplaceable. But there's still, work, still more work to do. Over the next several months, the industry's focus needs to be on the remediation of legacy contracts well before the date of cessation of LIBOR so that we don't have a last minute rush. And once we complete this final stretch of the transition, we can say good riddance to LIBOR. Now, even with the transition, when the transition from LIBOR is complete, the ARC's work will continue to shape the future. The ARC's laid out best practices for the use of reference rates grounded in overnight SOFR, and importantly, this envis envisages only limited use of term SOFR which doesn't share overnight SOFR's foundation in the deep and robust Treasury financing markets. It's incredibly important that financial institutions consistently act in ways that are aligned with these best practices so that we don't have to come back and clean up another mess. Unlike with Star Trek, the last thing anyone wants to watch is the sequel, LIBOR, The Next Generation. The LIBOR transition is tangible proof of what can be accomplished when all stakeholders, public and private, work together and persevere against all odds. That sense of purpose, collaboration, and accomplishment gives me great hope for the main topic of the conference today, Treasury market resiliency. And yes, there is much work to do, be done. Now, before I go on, here's a reminder that you know all too well I cannot leave behind, and that's the usual disclaimer that everything I say reflects my own views and not necessarily those of the Federal Open Market Committee or anyone else in the Federal Reserve System. I've long made the case a well-functioning U.S. Treasury market is critical for our economy and, in fact, for the entire world. But now I'd like to take a step further and explain how critically important a resilient financial system, and especially a resilient U.S. Treasury market, is for monetary policy. In the current environment of global, high global inflation, central banks around the world have been taking strong, decisive actions to restore price stability. Restoring price stability is of paramount importance because it is the foundation of sustained economic and financial stability. Price stability is not an either or, it's a must have. For monetary policy to be most effective, financial markets must function properly. Monetary policy influences the economy through by affecting financial conditions with the treasury market at the center of it all. If the tre treasury market isn't functioning well, it can impede the transmission of monetary policy to the economy. Now, these issues recall a long-standing debate over what should be done when there's a trade-off between monetary policy and financial stability goals. In the decade before the pandemic, this debate occurred in the context of inflation running persistently below the FOMC's long-run 2% inflation target. 
On one hand, there were those who argued that an extended period of accommodative policy aimed at boosting inflation would contribute to a buildup of asset prices, leverage, and risk-taking that would ultimately undermine financial stability. They concluded the policy should lean against the wind of financial stability risks, even at some cost to achieving the price stability goal. On the other side, I and others have argued that using monetary policy to address longer-term financial stability considerations could come at a high cost in terms of current economic activity and could also undermine credibility in the central bank's long-run inflation goal. For example, based on estimated effects of monetary policy on GDP and house prices, using monetary policy alone to fully deflate the housing bubble that preceded the global financial crisis would have caused a decline in output in the U.S even larger than the one that occurred during the recession of 2007 and 9. Now, today we're seeing this debate resurface, but it's in a very, very different economic reality. Some now argue that there's, a, again, a trade-off between price stability and financial stability goals. But this time, it's because of the large and rapid shifts in monetary policy may contribute to stresses and expose vulnerabilities in global financial markets. Investors in financial institutions need to adjust to a rapidly changing and highly uncertain environment and heightened uncertainty can add to market volatility, resulting in diminished market liquidity. But these debates about trade-offs expose what I think of as a basic problem. So everyone's familiar with the idea of a jack-of-all-trades. Using monetary policy to mitigate financial stability vulnerabilities can lead to unfavorable outcomes for the economy. And monetary policy should not try to be the jack-of-all-trades and a master of none. So there must be a better way. And fortunately, there is, and that's what we're here to discuss this year. Um, instead of looking at this as a problem of choosing a point on an unfavorable trade-off curve, we must look at ways to, sh ways to shift the curve by enhancing the resilience of the financial system. And the value of this approach has been proven uh, and demonstrated by the global efforts to strengthen the banking system following the global financial crisis. And despite all the economic uh, disruptions caused by COVID-19, the Russia's war in Ukraine, the banking system has functioned well, serving as a source of strength for the economy, not a weak link. As monetary policies, we need to count on well-functioning markets that promote financial stability as we pursue our price stability and maximum employment goals. So what can be done to enhance financial stability? At the Federal Reserve, we have instituted changes over the past few years that support market functioning in times of stress. In 2021, the FOMC introduced the standing repo facility and the FEMA repo facility. These standing facilities are priced such that they are not used often in normal times, but remain ready to provide liquidity as needed should funding pressures arise. We also must continue to prioritize having a robust financial system, and that starts with the most core market of all, the U.S. Treasury market. The Interagency Working Group for Treasury Market Surveillance is doing just that. Ahead of today's conference, the group published a progress report around its work to enhance the resilience of the U.S. Treasury market, and I strongly encourage everyone to read it. The report emphasizes progress made on the proposed expansion of central clearing, enhancements to data collection and transparency, and the potential for evolution in market structure. It's also important that we recognize that the world is not static. The Treasury market has increased enormously over the past quarter century, and the key players have changed um, significantly. And the rest of the financial system continues to evolve, with non-bank financial institutions playing an increasingly important role. The Financial Stability Board has been actively engaged, actively engaged in this space, assessing global trends and through a, monitor, through a monitoring exercise and developing policy recommendations to strengthen oversight and regulation. And here, right here at the New York Fed, we too are deepening our expertise in monitoring of NBFIs. But this is not just a job for the official sector. Like the successful public-private collaboration that is moving the world off of LIBOR, the private sector must do its part to enhance resilience as well. It means constructively and actively in engaging in improving the resilience of the Treasury market and related markets. It also means planning to build resiliency for episodes of volatility that can impair market liquidity and preparing for periods that have less certain funding, such as at year end. And it means being a source of strength to the financial system and the economy, not a weak link. Debates around financial stability and monetary policy have been longstanding and have tended to focus on what I think of as unfavorable trade-offs. Central banks must avoid being a jack of all trades and master of none. This time, the time is now to find solutions that strengthen our financial system without compromising our monetary policy goals. 
These issues are complex, but the need for meaningful progress on strengthening the resilience of core financial markets is clear. Thank you, and I look forward to the conference. Thank you, President Williams. Uh, at this time, we're going to jump right into our first panel, uh, which will focus on the potential uh, costs and benefits of broader central clearing in the U.S. Treasury market. And just to remind everyone, we will reserve some time at the end of the panel for our audience Q&A. Um, so I'm going to hand this over to Josh Frost. If I could ask the panelists to come up, please. Um, while they're coming up, uh, Josh is the Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets at the Treasury Department. Um, before serving as uh, Assistant Secretary, he spent more than 20 years at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in, uh, in various roles, and I'll let him introduce the rest of the panelists. on the topic of central clearing in the Treasury market. Among the efforts underway to improve Treasury market resilience is an evaluation and exploration of expanded central clearing. Um, while central clearing for cash and repo transactions has the potential to standardize risk management, improve netting efficiencies, and reduce counterparty risk, it also has implications for pricing and risk concentration. There may also be implications for liquidity, and we're going to talk about all this today. Um, some have advocated for increased central clearing in the Treasury market and have noted the potential for central clearing to enable broad adoption of all-to-all -all trading, also an, another topic of a panel discussion later today. Uh, the official sector has been evaluating whether central clearing can be broadened, how it could apply to various market participants, the types of access models, and the overall benefits and costs. But before we dive into all these issues, I want to make some brief introductions of our distinguished panel here. We're fortunate to have with us four senior market practitioners who can offer a range of perspectives on this topic, and I want to thank you all in advance for, for taking the time to be here today. Uh, first, uh, I'll, I'll go in order down the line. First, uh, Jerry Pucci from BlackRock. Jerry's the global head of fixed income trading and global head of repo at BlackRock and the CEO of BlackRock Execution Services. Jerry's also the chair of the Treasury Market Practices <coughs> Group, or the TMPG. Uh, Laura Klimple from DTCC. Laura's the general manager of, of FICC and the head of uh, SIFMU Business Development at DTCC focusing on fixed clearance and settlement services to a broader array of market participants, as well as enhancing fixed existing service offerings to further reduce risk and provide optimal capital and operational efficiencies to member firms. Uh, Lynn Passion is a senior portfolio manager at Schwab, responsible for managing Schwab's money funds and has more than 20 years of money fund PM experience. And finally, Kavi Gupta from Bank of America. Kavi is a managing director and co-head of global rates trading and counterparty portfolio management at B of A Securities. Kavi is jointly responsible for leading the firm's trading business in government bonds, linear and nonlinear interest rate derivatives in North America, EMEA, and APAC. All right, so with intros out of the way, let's dive in. Um, some just a broad structured plan here today. Um, go through repo, go through cash, and if we have some time, step back a bit and, and kind of look at the full picture. So maybe I'll, I'll start with a question for everybody. We'll, we'll go down the line for the first one, and we'll come back on the second question. Um, so starting with, with the repo market, from, from each of your perspectives and each of your seats, what do you see as the main potential benefits from broader central clearing in the repo market, and what would be your main concerns? And maybe we'll start with you, Jerry. Thanks, Josh. So it's great to see everybody. Um, first, I'll wear my TMPG hat for a second just to kind of level the playing field. 2007, on the first iteration of best practices. Promoting efficient market clearing was one of the senior pillars. We've now expanded to five sections. That is still one of the main proponents to promote uh, liquidity in the treasury market. So efficient market clearing is, is key. I would say in terms of transparency from the TMPG, we just released a white paper on SFTs um, within clearing and settlement, which we are actually looking for feedback from everybody here. Uh, on some of the maps, on what happens one in the, the financing market, in terms of the repo market, in terms of clearing, using treasuries as collateral. Um, so what does it mean to be centrally cleared, and what is the biggest risk that that white paper highlighted? Is that it is pretty bespoke. It's, it's not uniform, um, and one of the things that is most important in the treasury market is counterparty credit risk. And if there is efficient system that's out there to improve counterparty credit risk, and that, is, that would be a CCP. Now, to steal from what Michelle said and what President Williams said, 
the treasury market is global if I'm going to ask, like, what are the potential risks uh, to this? And so if you look, it is global. So the owners of treasury securities are, in fact, global, and they are posted many places across the globe. Now, to promote efficient treasury clearing, we need to make sure that those securities are made available to both borrow and lend in the repo market. I'm not sure if one size fits all for these global players in the market, but what I would highlight, I think there needs to be a lot more research done on this. I don't think there's enough data available on what's actually happening deep in the repo markets, especially in the bilateral markets. So I do think that there needs to be a lot more research that's out there to really find out how these securities circulate back into this collateral movement across the globe. Great. Okay. Maybe just a, a, a quick follow-up. Um, on, on the benefits, I, I certainly get the, the, the need for more data. Um, for the benefits that are uh, purported to be out there to be mm -hmm. realized, do you think those can be realized with a, a, a the current level of central clearing, a modest expansion, or do you think everything would need to be in? Is this an all or nothing proposition? Without the data, it's tough to speculate, but I would say it would marginally make FICC a safer institution as a bedrock within the, the Treasury Securities and Clearing section. Um, but I don't know if it's a one size fits all and you need to have everybody in. Um, as is highlighted, there's a lot of unique uses of treasury securities that are out there across the globe. Um, it's not only central bank, hedge fund, primary dealer, pension fund. I think we need to kind of open up our eyes and think that there's a lot more uses of treasury securities, especially with all of the regulation that's out there. There's a lot of treasury securities that are literally posted at exchanges across the globe. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Laura, your thoughts on repo? Yeah, when I think about the benefits of repo clearing, I think it's important to distinguish between what I would call the public goods and the private goods. And Josh, you touched on a couple of them in your opening remarks. Counterparty credit risk mitigation, which can also promote all-to-all -all trading by the fact that in, CC in clearing, all market participants face the CCP as the central counterparty and guarantor. There's reduced settlement security, security settlement risk, right? In the CCP, we are able to net down uh, a single deliver or receive obligation per member per day, um, which creates a tremendous amount of operational efficiencies in the market. Um, our centralized risk management ensures that the market liquidity and concentration risks associated with treasury market activity are externalized and borne by the market participants that, that are creating those risks. Um, and we're also able to centralize default management um, in a way that ensures that a default of a market participant isn't going to result in a fire sale, um, which otherwise could occur if market participants had to, you know, go out into the, into the open market and potentially compete against each other to liquidate collateral. And then the last point, Jerry touched on it too, central clearing is one way to increase transparency both for FICC and for the official sector in terms of the broader market and where the risks lie. Um, in terms of the private goods of repo clearing, um, I, I would venture to say that that is really what we have seen be the driver of the voluntary clearing of activity, particularly the buy side activity that we've seen in recent years. Um, so in terms of the private benefits, novation to a central counterparty creates balance sheet netting opportunities that can be very difficult to, for certain market participants who have directional positions to be able to replicate in the bilateral world. These balance sheet netting efficiencies can create capital efficiencies for the intermediaries to the extent a netted balance sheet is favorable for various capital charges like supplemental leverage ratio. Novation to a CCP can also um, create other uh, capital benefits like reduction in single um, entity counterparty limits, GSIB surcharge, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, private goods, I would say, that are uh, what I would, would argue are really driving the momentum, the recent momentum of buy-side repo into clearing. In terms of what I would call concerns, I completely agree with Jerry. One thing we are constantly focused on in FICC 
is ensuring that the tent door is wide enough uh, for all of the different types of repo activity uh, that is looking to come in, the different market participants and the different <coughs> workflows. So we've made a variety of expansions to our services over the past five years in reaction to the growing demand for clearing services, but you know we can't rest on our laurels. We are, to Jerry's point, going to potentially be servicing a global community, and we completely agree that given the, di the diversity of the participants in the treasury market, including some heavily regulated players like the 2A7 funds, that one size is not gonna fit all, one clearing model is not gonna fit everyone, so we believe in a variety of, of different models that people can choose from based on their various parameters and business models. So you, you mentioned the tent. Uh, yes. I wanna just maybe <laughs> dig into one entrance to the tent, I guess, uh, which would be sponsored repo. And just get your sense, do you think the sponsored repo model uh, is the answer here? Do you think other models might be necessary? And maybe dr drilling a little bit more on sponsored, why today, does, why isn't everyone using that entrance in the tent? Are there, are there constraints and you know, maybe just, uh, is there anything else needed that's not there today and sponsored that you think might be needed if there were to be a uh, an expansion. Right, so we, we do have multiple client clearing models. Sponsored is just one of yeah. them. We also have a prime broker and, an, and a correspondent clearing model, which can be used for repo, as well as a centrally cleared institutional tri-party service for cash lenders into repo. So we have a variety of models that can be used, again, based on you know, market participants' preferences and, and business models. I think the real, but, but one observation, Josh, that um, what, one thing that we've noted is that although there's a growing community of market participants that use central clearing, uh, they use it opportunistically in the sense that when we see balance sheets most constrained, um, when we see capital uh, demand for capital efficiencies uh, at, at, at their highest, that's where we see our spikes in volume, uh, where balance sheets are, are less tight and or where other investment options like T-bills or the reverse repo program are more preferable, we see our volumes more muted. So I would say, you know, it's, uh, it ebbs and flows based on market conditions. Um, but in terms of the barriers left, I would say they're largely regulatory in nature, um, some, of, some of which uh, you know, are, are in the process of being solved and some which we still need to work on. So you know, one, of the, one of the major issues was the fact that uh, margin currently can't be freely rehypothecated from a client through a broker-dealer to FICC without the dealer having to take a dollar-for-dollar dollar hit in the reserve formula. That's something that the recent SEC proposal would correct, and we believe that will make it a lot more efficient and economical for broker-dealers to be able to intermediate activity and clearing. Um, there are also certain counterparty restrictions and limitations out there that are challenging. Um, some registrants out there can't face a CCP as a good repo counterparty under their current regulations. Those need to be changed. There are also counterparty limits that are imposed by the rating agencies on FIC as if it were a traditional dealer that need to be addressed. And then I'd also add that there's still work to be done uh, with the 2A7 fund community um, to be able to deem a term repo and clearing to be fitting in their weekly li liquid bucket. So there's a, a host of, I would say, regulatory frictions that still need to be smoothed out um, in order to, I would say, see full adoption um, if market conditions are right. Great, thanks. Uh, Lynn, how, how, do you, how do you see it from your seat? Yeah, so, um, I, you know, from the benefit side, very much the same. Um, you're reducing your counterparty risk, no question, that's, that's a big positive. Um, and our experience has been really good with that. Um, then looking at another benefit is the access to more investable supply, potentially, from smaller dealers who maybe can participate through the program who we couldn't face or, or money funds can't face directly. Um, and then, you know, with the bigger dealers, another way for them to provide supply to the market with balance sheet netting benefits, that kind of thing. So, so those are a high level, how we think about that. And then on the, the sides that are more challenging, certainly agree with everything that's been said. Um, concentrating counterparty risk is a concern, of course, when you have an operational, um, you know, everyone going in through the same uh, facility, you know, rises, raises some risks there. Um, and given it's a different way of, of interacting in the repo market, engaging in the repo market, um, 
there are, you know, credit, like how, do, how does credit evaluate this as our counterparty? And then in addition to um, just the operational piece, getting the infrastructure, technology, all that to, to interact and settle trades and engage with those, those trades. But those are some of the things we're thinking about. What, what would you see as room for improvement in the current structure? I know that, <laughs> that's, that's the million dollar question. Yeah. I think, you know, having more options as far as how to engage in that market yeah. is probably the best way to, to think about it. More doors in the tent, sounds like. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Kavi, uh, now to you, you've got a, certainly a different perch than our other panelists here. Uh, how do you see this? Yeah, so from our point of view, um, I think the number one thing to talk about is uh, the resilience in the market because of the implicit deleveraging that, you know, forcing a little bit more margin in the system when it comes to repo will force, right? So I think that's an important point to talk about. And certainly that's one of the, the biggest benefits that, that we see from a resilience perspective. Now, we'll talk about liquidity, which actually <coughs> suffer on a day-to-day -day basis, or, you know, potentially in a stress environment as well. So there's two aspects to that. Um, but certainly levered participation in the treasury market will decrease as costs go up and as clearing comes in. And that's a, a consideration, I think, but one of the benefits is it's probably a good thing if some, there's some more margin, some more haircuts in the system uh, for obvious reasons. Um, transparency will certainly improve uh, in the market, I think especially with respect to repo. You could get data around uh, specific issues you know, that are concentrated, leverage around specific issues. I think that'll be an interesting new angle um, and, and data to look at, I think, in terms of the functioning of the treasury market. Um, I think from an operational standpoint, and you know, I think the TMPG did a great job in their paper, the repo market is definitely way far behind a bunch of the other markets. So I think this would be a good step in order to get the operations of the repo market move towards more of a modern STP type um, scenario. So I think the TMPG has kind of laid that out. I think this would be a good step towards that. I think the most important benefit is netting. Uh, I think how it's implemented is, 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 is very important and the devil is in the details. Um, as many counterparties that can participate, the better it is, the more the netting benefit is. There's certainly challenges with that in the current structure and I think Laura and, and Lynn have kind of laid those out very eloquently. But I think to the extent we can get everyone to participate, the netting benefit is, is quite substantial actually. Uh, from a broker dealer standpoint. So that from our perspective uh, is the biggest positive. Um, in terms of the concerns that we have and the feedback that we get from our clients, that's been a little bit mixed actually on this topic. Uh, one, the costs are gonna go up. So the cost to transact in treasuries, especially with the amount of debt in the system, especially post COVID, um, people feel like that's a vulnerability actually. And if certain aspects of the market stop participating um, especially the levered community, then that's something that, that our clients actively talk about. What does that do to off-the-run liquidity? What does that do to cash futures basis? Uh, and what does that actually do longer term to the cost of issuing debt? So I think that's the biggest concern. Um, I think clearly the cost to build an infrastructure like this and the time it'll take to build an infrastructure like this is substantial. It'll naturally favor the larger players and I think some of the smaller players may fall behind on some of these things. So that's something to think about as well in terms of the distribution of participation in the marketplace. Um, and then the concentration of the risk around the CCPs, which I'm sure Laura and team will figure out. Uh, those are the sorts of things that, that, that we think about when it comes to repo perspective, repo clearing. So you mentioned the netting benefits. I'm curious how you see that playing out. So one, uh, one version of the story I often will hear is, yeah, th there will be netting benefits, but what really matters is what you do with those netting benefits as a dealer. So do you, do you have any sense of what the rea likely reaction would be? Do you think you get the netting benefits so there's more repo, more balance sheet available or more, more repo available that you could offer? Or do you think take the efficiency and run <laughs> and, and, uh, and use balance sheet elsewhere? Do, do, and not just asking for your firm, but what do you think like, the, the likely reaction would be for the market writ large? I think it's a great question. I think it all depends on how these things play out. So first of all, how does the cost structure work? Are costs passed on to the clients to a certain extent? If they are, um, does pricing change for repo? So, you know, and for a lot of the relative value relationships or for the lending, if, if returns improve, then certainly the allocation will be to those relevant asset classes. 
Um, I think generally treasuries will become more efficient from that perspective. So I'd imagine that it'll be more broad based, the financing activity, and we'll have more room to, to capture other pieces. But obviously our limiting constraints are several. There's capital constraints. Uh, and so all of the, that whole jigsaw puzzle would need to be considered. And so I think it's not an easy question to answer. I, I don't really know the answer to that question. But there's just more room, I think. From a treasury perspective, it's pretty straightforward and it's substantial. Great. Thanks. I, I don't either. That's why I yeah. asked. Um, <laughs> right, I think we've, we've, uh, we've yeah. covered repo. Let's go to cash. And maybe, Kavi, if I could yeah. put it on you to, sure. uh, to start. Um, just when you think about cash, do you, do you see the calculus the same way, the benefits uh, and concerns the same way, or are there are there meaningful differences that are worth yeah. digging into? I think on the cash side, the feedback we received is uh, is a little bit weaker and a little bit more mixed relative to repo. I think the case on repo uh, from the conversations with clients is stronger. The case in cash, um, the first obvious benefit is the transparency that you get. Although people do highlight that with trace reporting being uh, ramped up, as well as uh, portfolio trading companies being required to register. Um, is it redundant, some of these requirements? But certainly the transparency aspect will improve, and there are a lot of people in the market who are advocating very strongly for that, so certainly yeah, that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, although I don't think it's gonna be a game changer, especially if some of these other things are implemented as well. I think the first, uh, the, the most important benefit will be around fails and settlement. Uh, but even that is not really considered that big a problem today in the treasury market, especially after you have all these, uh, these penalty rates on these fails. So even in March 2020, we didn't have a big spike up in fails or anything like that. So it's not something that keeps people up at night, per se. So people question to what end. Um, in, so, so those are the potential benefits, and, and those are maybe slightly weaker than the case for repo, which is much stronger. Um, as far as the, 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 uh, the potential costs of transacting, again, coming back to that, the cost of transacting in the treasury market is going to go up. And as dealers, we are certainly concerned about that, what that does to liquidity. I think that impacts the cash market quite a bit. Um, and, and I think, generally speaking, the pro-cyclical nature of margins that we've seen um, is a big concern as well. In a stressed environment, as volatility goes up, margins go up, they don't come, down, come back down as quickly. That has a lot of second and third order impacts on the funding, bank funding, and a lot of these different things. We've seen that happen multiple times over the last four or five years. So that's also something to think about, is that implicitly causes deleveraging, but deleveraging may not be a good thing in a stressed environment. So that is something that stresses us out when it comes to cleared products. Um, obviously, cleared products have shown massive benefits, but that's one of those things that that I think could potentially be something that, uh, that the market is not pricing in as a, as, as a significant risk. So, so I, I get your point on the, the increase in margin in a stressed yeah. environment. Do you see uh, uh, any benefits in the stressed environment to, to greater central clearing? I'm thinking, you know, to your point on fails, yes, we didn't see yeah. a massive uptick in fails in March of 20, uh, but we sure did in 2008. Um, it, is there a real benefit there, or is that mostly addressed with things like the TMPG's fails charge and other things, and the, do you think those benefits are oversold or there we, could be real benefits in stress? We receive mixed feedback on this. Yeah. Like today, people are not too worried about treasury settlement. Treasury settled, most of them settle T plus one. So people are not too worried on the cash side about that settlement risk, that counterparty risk, those things, because it's T plus one. Um, it's not keeping people up at night. Now, certainly these things are beneficial, the marginally better for, but they're not viewed by our clients as game changers per se, because that's not the big issue that they're focused on, at least in the experience of the last five, seven, ten years. Yeah, thanks. Lynn, same question. How do you yeah, see it? I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I would, I would add maybe the, to the cost piece of it, and if the cost became prohibitive for smaller dealers, again, who, who maybe get pushed out of the market or pushes out, you know, any participant that was unwilling to put the put the operational costs involved there then you, are you indirectly reducing liquidity for for a market that seems transparent the, the transparency piece of course but um but that would be my my main concern and if costs go up how do, how do you think about that changing your participation in the treasury market yeah so it's interesting um 
you know, the cost certainly would be indirect for us on the investment side. Yeah. Um, but when you think about the world of mutual funds and money funds, there are funds that are mandated to invest in treasuries. So you have a bit of a captive audience there. And so, you know, depending on the magnitude of those indirect costs, does that get funneled down essentially to the shareholders in those portfolios? So that's one aspect of it. Thanks. Laura. Yeah, it's an interesting question. From, from our perspective, the, the costs actually of risk managing a treasury repo and, and a treasury cash trade are essentially the same, mm. right? From a clearinghouse's standpoint, the costs are, are, are not different. What I would observe is that, as I talked about before, the private goods of clearing a cash treasury trade are much less profound than they are for repo. Um, re, uh, cash trades are, don't have to be recorded in the same way on a dealer's balance sheet as the repo does. And capital charges don't start attracting, and even when they do, they're fairly modest until the trade fails, right, or to, until settlement fails. So, you know, our observation, we talked about this in our May 2021 white paper, is that we don't think there will be, you know, as much voluntary gravitation towards central clearing for the cash trades because the private goods are less but the costs of clearing are the same, right, as they, as they are for repo. And just one other point I would observe on costs, I think from our, our vantage point, certainly when you're in central clearing, the costs of market risk, liquidity risk, concentration risk associated with a treasury transaction are forced to be externalized and collateralized by the market participants who are trading. You know, from our perspective, we don't think that there are no costs associated with bilateral transactions. It's just they may not be, potentially may not be margined and risk managed in the same way outside of central clearing. Um, but that doesn't mean that the risks aren't there. And they could ultimately, in a default situation, be borne not just by the parties to that trade, but potentially the broader market. And I think that's another consideration that we, could, we, should, we should think on. That's a great point. I, I'm curious if you think there are <clears throat> structural considerations today that result in less uh, central clearing of cash beyond the ones you just mentioned, and are, is there a way to take those observations and apply them to a clearing model that reduces those concerns or those costs? Yeah, I mean, certainly one of the things that we've been strong advocates for is margin efficiency. Um, one of the things that we've been working very hard on is to improve the cross-margining that we offer today between FICC cleared cash and repo and uh, CME cleared interest rate futures. So I think to the extent that clearing can offer more margin efficiencies and portfolio margining across offsetting positions across asset classes, I think the more attractive it will become. But the question will be, it won't be free, right? Nonetheless, there will still be margin that'll have to be paid. And the question will be, you know, whether that that requirement will be offset, you know, by the by the by the goods that, that the clearing provides outside of public goods. So I think that's the question. I, I think it's, 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 not, it's not free, right? So the question will be, you know, at, you know how, how, much can, uh, how much efficiency can we offer and will it be enough to move activity in on a voluntary basis? Yeah, there's, there's no free lunch except for the lunch at the, during the break <laughs> at the conference. Uh, Jerry, uh, curious to get your take. Sure, I, I think you, you've so on the repo side, you hear a lot about netting, and then you hear on the outright side, you hear netting two very different nets, okay? So on the repo side, people are not borrowing and lending securities 25,000 times, and then you're netting down that trade, right? You're netting a borrow from one client, lending it to another client. That's what you're netting. You're netting a balance sheet loan and um, a borrow. On the outright side, very different netting, single QCIP, you're netting down buys and sells all day long. So it's a very different risk. I think in 2019, the TMPG released, released a white paper on clearing and settlement on the outright treasury side, breaking down trading and treasuries into two components, the inner dealer market and then the dealer to client market. Very different markets. One is anonymous. I think that's a key component, especially when you're looking at a CCP that's supposed to mitigate counterparty risk versus a very transparent counterparty give up on a T plus one settlement when you're talking dealer to client. Very different worlds. In the TMPG paper, we highlighted the risks within the interdealer broker market, 
where not all participants are clearing through the same mechanism. I think that that's a risk that should be addressed. Uh, and I'm not sure, again, because of the global nature of the treasury product, um, if it's really, you know, and I would encourage a phased approach um, and, and really get the data because I'm not really sure if we really have enough data. I think there's a lot of data in that white paper from 2019, but on an ongoing basis, whether it's more research within to the trace data, I would definitely encourage more study along those lines uh, once you move beyond that. So can I ask you, uh, I guess, a similar question to the one I asked Lynn, which is, you know, for, from your seat, uh, how do you see this impacting on net if there were to be a, a broad expansion of central clearing and cash? How do you see it impacting liquidity? And how would that impact on liquidity affect your behavior and interaction with the market? It's a toughie. Here's what I like to say. As human beings, we are terrible at forecasting. I mean, <laughs> we got all these PhDs here, and I'm not sure if anybody can come up with non-farm payroll. But we tell a great story. And so you give me the number, I can tell you the story about what's going to happen. So what's the story that everybody's going to tell is their biggest fear, their tail risk. So anybody here, what's their biggest tail risk? Kavi's worried about losing a client. Right? I'm worried about rising costs for my, for my pension funds. So I think those are the tail risks that you're worried about. I would think any kind of a central clearing on margin is a positive. Um, taken too extreme, too quickly without enough research on the data could be problematic. I know I'm skirting it and I apologize. That's okay. I, 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 I like to often say that um, my phone does not usually ring off the hook with people calling to tell me liquidity is excellent and they love it. So I, I, I take your point there. Um, Although I will say once you know certainty, liquidity is a lot better when you have certainty as opposed to uncertainty. Fair, fair enough. Um, maybe just to zoom out a bit for a moment. Um, you know, we've talked about repo, we've talked about cash. Um, do you think this helps, I mean, go back to the focus of today's conference. It's about the resilience of the treasury market. On net, would a broad expansion of central clearing make the treasury market more resilient or less resilient? And maybe I'll, I'll go down the, the line this way again. Jerry, nice. Do you want to start with that toughie? I mean, I think it's, it's safe to say it would certainly make it more resilient. Um, would it improve liquidity? That, I think, is, is a little bit unclear. I think the resiliency clearly would improve, um, but I think with a lot more research, while it is a risk-free asset for pricing other assets, from a clearing and settlement perspective, it's not a risk-free transaction. So wherever you can mitigate the risks, it's gonna improve the treasury resiliency without a shadow of a doubt. I think that's a, a, a known. Um, so I don't think that it would not improve the resiliency unless the scope maybe got too broad where you lose participants in the treasury market, which I don't think that is anybody's intention. And from a, just to take a step back, which I think might be like an implicit assumption here, that the resilience of the treasury market today is, I think in some cases, almost taken as a given. And if it were to come into question, it seems to uh, maybe like an obvious point to me that if the resilience of the market were really to come into question, there'd be some pretty unpredictable effects on liquidity. So I'm curious, does, does your take on this differ from, differ when considering normal market functioning times and times of stress? Certainly, certainly. This, these are all uh, mildly positive and, and, and good times. In bad times, it comes down to the relationship and um, you would hope that it would make the system safer for the peripheral because it's a counterparty credit issue which was more of a 2008 crisis. 2020 was not really a counterparty credit issue. That was a global pandemic where the dash for cash was out there, where you had one size uh, fits all. I'm not sure uh, it would marginally improve efficiency through 2020, but I think counterparty risk in 2008, I think it would certainly help in that kind of crisis. So um, on the margin, definitely on the, on the good times, um, on the margin, on the bad times. Unfortunately for, for Governor Williams, most of the market still looks at the central bank as the, the bad times person. Okay, uh, th thanks, Jerry. Uh, Laura. Yeah, so certainly central clearing is not a cure-all 
right? Uh, central clearing cannot solve for supply demand mismatches like we saw in March 2020 and September 2019. However, it, it does play a role and we've seen it play a role to increase liquidity where the liquidity is otherwise being constrained by balance sheet and capital constraints, right? So um, interestingly, we, we've seen our peak volumes uh, voluntarily coming into the clearinghouse at times of market stress and people gladly paying the margins um, in order to be able to transact. And you know, I do think that has helped the liquidity of the market because of the fact that it's created capacity where otherwise that capacity would be constrained. So you know, in that sense, I think treasury clearing can help to increase liquidity, but it really depends on what the constraint is. Do you have any concerns though? So as we've been talking through this, like this is in some, um, to some extent, I think a, a lot of this discussion is predicated on more activity coming to you all. Do you have any concerns there from a risk management perspective? How do you think about what the implications would be uh, as a risk manager? Sure, that's a great question. So. Um, FIC already plays a pretty critical role in the treasury market. We clear four to five trillion of treasury activity. Today, we are, uh, you know, have the highest regulation of any financial market utility in the United States with our designation as a, as a SIFMU. And I'm sure, you know, any iteration or, or, or entrance of new activity into the clearinghouse will be, you know, subject to strict scrutiny and, and, and heavy supervision by our regulators. So, you know, rest assured, there will be a lot of eyes on, on, on the growth of, of, of central clearing. But I think one observation, you know, people talk about a concentration of risk and that, you know, all um, increases in central clearing are going to have a linear increase in risk. I would offer a different view which is that what we have observed as more transactions and sort of the entire ecosystem of, of trading start coming into clearing, not just sell side transactions, but buy side transactions as well, we've observed netting impacts, netting effects, right? Where some market participants who are transacting flat, we don't see them, you know, or historically we haven't seen them as, as flat, we've seen them as directional. Um, and so starting to see all the legs of the trades has, can also create netting effects, which can help mitigate market risk. It can help importantly mitigate liquidity risk. So I think, you know, while careful, you know, careful scrutiny needs to be paid, there can be benefits in terms of risk mitigation by bringing more activity in the CCP as well. Thanks. Lynn? Yeah, um, I think because the market is so big and so many participants that um, in order for it to improve liquidity, it is, is it really that everyone has to be on board with it to, to facilitate that liquidity? Um, so that's sort of one piece of it. And then how operationally, how do they interact with that clearinghouse? So I think it it is a positive on the margin. Um, but again, when we're thinking about sort of the short end where, where it's a lot of the supply demand um, imbalance. So is that helpful? Um, does it you know, address those kinds of issues? Maybe, maybe a similar question, I guess, to the one I, I'd asked Laura, the, the concentration issue. So mm -hmm. if you think about your, your activity, yep. concentrating more with one counterparty, I know there are some limits on 287 funds, but absent, let's maybe step away from the, the, the hard limits. Is this something that would be a topic of discussion at the firm uh, about uh, increasing concentration <laughs> um, or? Absolutely, yeah. okay. yes, it would. It would be um, not necessarily, and you know, ending as this is a concern, we're not gonna do it, more to really think through and get comfortable with, you know, how we've evaluated it and, um, and, and just trying to think through all the potential pitfalls or risks. Cop? Yeah, I think, um, I think it remains to be seen. As, as, as Jerry said, I think it's a little bit hard to predict, but my assumption is that on a day-to-day -day basis, liquidity would suffer, cost of transacting going up, the returns that investors need going up. Um, but I certainly think resilience would be better. So in a stressed environment, uh, some of the benefits that Laura mentioned as well, I think you would start to see those. So I think the resilience will be there, um, especially when you combine all these other initiatives that are happening as well with a portfolio trading company registrations, as well as the transparency with Trace, I certainly think it's a lot of change that's yeah. coming, 
So it's really hard to see how the different players will kind of react to that. Certainly, the first thing that comes to my mind, again, is that the larger players will find it easier to adapt. Some of the smaller players may not find it worth their while to adapt. And so that might become a liquidity problem. I don't know. Maybe the bigger players will just get bigger. So that's something to think about. Uh, that's probably an unintended you know, result of this, uh, of this regulation. Um, so those are kind of some of the things we think about. Um, also, in terms of the cost structure, are those costs passed on to clients or not? And how, many, and how do clients then adapt? Uh, do people start to move towards the prime brokerage type model? Um, and how do those things adapt? That's a little bit more uncertain. I think clients do have options, especially, again, the larger clients. The smaller clients, again, may end up being a little bit more marginalized. So again, that's not a great result. So those are the things that we kind of think about. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the incredibly unfair thing of asking you to predict the future. Are there, are there any, um, you know, you mentioned there are a lot of risks here, there's a lot of uncertainty. Is there anything that you think you're, you're reasonably sure of today, uh, behaviorally, that you'd expect to see from a liquidity perspective, from a market uh, composition perspective, or there's just, it's too, it's too uncertain, too unclear, there's too much fog, yeah. we'd have to wait I, and see I think what two happens. things. One, the big players will get bigger, both on the buy side as well as the sell side. Uh, and I think, um, I think pricing will get wider. So off the runs will cheapen, cash futures basis will cheapen, the cost of leverage will go up, the returns that investors need for Treasury, especially with Treasury supply this high, uh, and the Fed not really doing QE anymore, those things will, will be higher. Thank you. Well, time flies when you're talking central clearing. Um, I, I want to thank you all um, uh, for, for all this. I know we're running a little bit short on time. I wanted to leave at least a few minutes for any questions from the audience. And um, if you've got a question, please do identify yourself and your firm. Right there and then. I'm Larry Harris. Um with uh, USC and uh, Interactive Brokers. In a discussion about central clearing, I find it interesting that we haven't talked anything about um, how we see central clearing in, in virtually all markets in which there's clearing members, we have uh, introducing brokers, we have brokers and plaintiffs, there's a whole chain of people who evaluate credit worthiness. So that chain creates a very efficient network where the number of credit relationships is minimized, which is the cost of which ultimately lowers the cost of trading. So the question is, is, is um, what sort of problems would um, would we see when we when we build a central clearing system where we have, um, say, 20 designated um, clearing members and under that uh, correspondence and so forth? You want to take that? <laughs> um, so I, I think one observation that, that I would make is that the treasury market is a very diverse market and there are players in this market that do not clear in other asset classes, all right? And so I think having one singular central clearing model is not going to work, you know, and I'll, I'll turn to Lynn. Um, the 2A7 fund community, as an example, have very strict regulations such that they can't practically contribute to initial margin, to variation margin, liquidity facilities, they can't pay clearing fees. So a lot of uh, what a client clearing in other asset classes would expect to be charged back, they can't, as a regulatory matter, absorb. So we need to have other models, such as a principal trading model, which we offer in our sponsored service, to be able to allow them to transact in clearing in a way that they can compensate their intermediary through a spread. So I think, you know, from our perspective, we support having a variety of models, both a sort of give up style client clearing model, as you would see in other asset classes, as well as principal style trading, because we believe that's the way to make the tent door wide enough to be able to bring in all of the important players in the treasury market into clearing. Thanks. Any other takes on that? If not, I'll, I'll open it back up. Okay. Any other uh, questions from the audience? I think I, we have one in the front. Thank you. Rick McVeigh, uh, Market Access, thank you for your comments. Kavi, probably uh, directed mostly at you, but when you think about central clearing for the U.S. Treasury market and all the margin that would go with it, 
How important is it to think about cross-margining with Treasury futures to make sure that it's capital efficient and you can provide the liquidity that you need for your clients? I think it's, in, I think it's incredibly important given that cost is the largest, uh, I guess, pushback from our clients in terms of this. Um, and I think Laura hit on this a little bit in terms of if you think about the levered participation in the marketplace um, has gone up substantially in the last five, seven years as Treasury issuance has gone up. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the ownership of Treasuries on the margin is now done on a levered basis against futures and things like that. So I think those positions have gone up quite a bit. Levered fund, fund positions in, in Treasury futures are very, very high, and they will stay high. Um, so I think that, that is a benefit. But I think Laura said it well, that I don't think it's going to eliminate the cost. It'll certainly help. And I think if you don't have something like that, that's going to be a major problem. So I think the assumption is you will have something like that. If you don't have that, we're talking uh, more of a problem, I think. The costs are, so I think that's assumed that we will have something like that. So we have cross-margining between yeah. um, house positions across yeah. asset classes today, between futures and cash. Yeah. But what we don't have is regulatory approval to cross-margin end user clients, yeah. right, across the two asset yeah. classes. And that's something that I agree is very important, especially yeah. if we're going to see increased central clearing in the Treasury yeah. market. Well, I see we're at time. I uh, want to thank all the panelists. Everyone, please uh, join me in thanking everyone for the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, is this thing on? Thank you again to the panelists for that lively discussion. We're going to take a short break and reconvene at 11.15. Uh, so that's in 25 minutes. See you all back then. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. If I could ask everybody to take your seats, we'll get started again. Might have to be louder. Hello again, everybody. If I could ask everybody to take their seats and we'll get started again, please. Hello and, and welcome back. Um, I'm now going to introduce Nellie Lang, Treasury's Undersecretary for Domestic Finance, who will be delivering keynote remarks. Uh, Undersecretary Lang was confirmed into her position in July of last year. Prior to serving at Treasury, she was a senior fellow in economic studies at Brookings, also a visiting scholar in, at the IMF's Monetary and Capital Markets Department, a lecturer at the Yale School of Management, and a member of the CBO's panel of economic advisors. She also held a range of positions over the course of three decades at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, including as the first director of the Division of Financial Stability from 2010 to 2017. Um, please join me in welcoming Undersecretary Lang. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you to everyone here um, for the opportunity to speak. It's really exciting to be back at a conference in person and in this beautiful renovated space. It's quite nice. Um, so I'd like to thank our colleagues in the Interagency Working Group on Treasury Market Surveillance, the IAWG, for co-hosting this conference. The collaboration between the IAWG members has been tremendously important as we've collectively prioritized efforts to strengthen the resilience of the Treasury market. I believe we have made significant progress on a path to a more resilient market, but there is still more to do. Today, I'd like to begin by offering some thoughts, observations about the current liquidity conditions in Treasury markets. After that, I will talk about the overall work of the IAWG and then present some information about a key work stream led by Treasury to improve data quality and transparency to the public. So let me start with Treasury market liquidity. The Treasury market plays a critical role to finance the federal government, 
support the broader financial system, and to implement monetary policy. And a liquid, well-functioning market is key to supporting those objectives. Over the past year or so, liquidity conditions in the Treasury market have shown some deterioration. But I believe these conditions largely reflect the heightened uncertainty about economic and geopolitical considerations. It is not surprising that it's somewhat harder to trade and more expensive to trade, but there is a significant amount of trading that is occurring. In addition, and perhaps more importantly, we've not seen si strong signs to date that the decline in liquidity is itself driving up financial uncertainty. So as you know, asset price volatility has risen substantially this year, clearly reflecting the disruptive impact of Russia's war on Ukraine, combined with lingering uncertainties about supply chain disruptions and about the persistence of higher inflation. As you can see in this first figure, the volatility of the yields of the two-year and the 10-year Treasury notes have both risen. But the rise in the two-year, which is the orange line, is much sharper than for the 10-year, reflecting the greater uncertainties in the near term. Historically, volatility has had a significant negative effect on liquidity conditions. And this relationship is illustrated in figure two, which, which is um, the inverse relation between the volatility of yields, which is on the horizontal axis, and market depth on the vertical axes. Market depth in this chart is measured by the depth of resting orders on a central limit order book in the electronic interdealer segment of this market. So market depth for the two-year note, which is the um, on your left, currently is very low. It's shown by the orange cloud of dots. It's near the lows of March 2020, near the light blue, as been pointed out by many observers. <coughs> But volatility is notably higher than it was in 2020. Um, by contrast, if you look at the 10-year note on the right-hand side, uh, current market depth is well above, again, the orange dots or the red dots here, well above March 2020, despite similar levels of volatility in the two periods. In addition, investors often cite price impact or the price movements that can occur as a result of their trades as a key concern. As shown in the next figure, an estimate of price impact indicates that it's increased across 10 years since late 2021, but relatively less for the 10-year than for the two-year note, again linking back to the relatively higher volatility at the front end than at the longer end. And another measure, bid-ask spreads, shown in figure four, has also increased across tenors and shows episodic spikes in the two-year note. While these indicators paint a picture of higher costs and less ease of transacting that is linked to higher volatility, so far the market more broadly has continued to operate well during these particularly volatile times. As the next figure shows, transaction volumes have not indicated any sustained decline in significant activity that clears through the Treasury market every day. Trading volumes are high, at an average of above 600 billion per day in recent months, and regular conversations with market participants are consistent with this characterization. And as the next figure shows, the volume reflects an increase in net selling of off-the-run securities shown by the three-month average shown by the red line. And this volume shows an increase in the net selling of off the runs in recent months, though clearly at far moderate levels than in March 2020. Overall, investors in recent months have been able to continue to transfer risk in large size at all tenors, though at somewhat higher costs. Still, there is a risk that more negative shocks could lead to disruptions in market functioning, particularly if the shocks were amplified by leverage, funding mismatches, or other constraints at Treasury market participants. It's therefore important that we continue to closely monitor this critical market for signs of rising vulnerabilities.
Let me turn now to the official sector's recent efforts to enhance the resilience of the Treasury market. The market has changed significantly over time. There have been changes in technology, participants, regulations, and Treasury debt outstanding has grown dramatically. Moreover, episodes of significant market stress in recent years highlight the need for this important program of work. Actions to enhance resilience are designed to support the Treasury market's ability to absorb and not significantly amplify adverse market shocks that could lead to breakdowns in intermediation. These actions are not meant to eliminate the kinds of changes in liquidity, those due to increases in volatility, like we have seen in recent months. Moreover, we do not expect actions could fully insulate market liquidity from unpredictably large exogenous shocks, such as the pandemic in March of 2020. When I spoke at last year's conference, virtually, um, the IAWG had just released a staff progress report on its review of potential policies and five work streams to enhance Treasury market resilience. And this past September, Treasury released a fact sheet which highlighted 12 key actions taken that are in line with these work streams. And just last week, the IAWG released a second staff progress report to summarize recent developments and accomplishments, provide greater perspective about some future work. All told, the official sector has, been made, has made tremendous progress in a short period of time, though, as I said, there is still much work ahead. We will hear about some of these efforts today. You've already heard about central clearing. We will hear about enhanced oversight of participants and venues, options perhaps for more uniform leverage requirements, and all-to-all -all trading. So I want to focus on recent accomplishments and the road ahead for two parts of the work stream to improve data quality and transparency. The first is the data collection in the non-centrally cleared bilateral repo market by the Office of Financial Research, OFR. And the second is data on transactions in the secondary cash market and efforts to improve prove public transparency of that data. The work to improve data quality and availability in the Treasury market was developed to support the official sector's ability to assess market conditions and preparedness to respond to market stresses, and also to provide transparency that fosters public confidence, fair trading, and a market ecosystem that provides for more resilient and elastic liquidity. One of the largest remaining gaps in the Treasury market for the official sector is the non-centrally cleared bilateral repo market, where transactions are conducted between two firms without a central counterparty. At the beginning of this year, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York updated its primary dealer statistics to capture primary dealer repo activity in different repo market segments. This can be seen in figure seven as a whole, primary dealer outstanding based on reverse repo has been roughly $2 trillion in the past few years. And according to the new data, about 60% of primary dealer repo lending and about 40% of primary dealer repo borrowing occurs in the non-centrally cleared bilateral repo market segment, which is the orange part of this figure. This suggests an important gap to fill on primary dealer counterparties and terms of trades. To assess filling this gap, OFR conducted a pilot data collection on this segment in June 2022, covering nine U.S. registered broker-dealers over three days in June. This pilot was conducted after extensive consultation with market participants and drew upon learnings from an earlier pilot completed in 2015. Enough of the recent pilot data have been collected for us to share some preliminary results. First, based on our initial observations for the first day of the collection, the pilot confirmed that participants conduct significantly larger volumes of transactions in this segment of the market than in the centrally cleared segments. 
Second, the pilot data indicates that Treasury securities are the dominant collateral in this market, representing almost 95% of repo and 85% of reverse repo. And that is similar to activity and other repo segments. Third, we can see a bit about also who dealers are lending to and on what terms. While there are a variety of borrowers, <clears throat> such as banks, other broker dealers, some types of asset managers, more than half are hedge funds. And being able to look at hedge fund exposures will be very helpful for evaluating when leverage or other vulnerabilities in the treasury market are increasing. Fourth finding is with respect to terms and standards, the pilot indicates that borrowing rates in this segment of the market are similar to those in the other repo market segments. In particular, the distribution of rates for overnight treasury securities, treasury securities collateralized repo is similar to rates in the centrally cleared market. But there are some significant distinctions that make this market different, and those are in maturities and in haircuts. The segment of the market has more trades with longer maturities. Less than 40% of the data collected from the pilot participants are overnight transactions, compared to more than 70% in the centrally cleared segment. And more than 30% of total volume has maturities of more than 30 days. In addition, and as previewed in 2015, almost 75% of the repo transactions collateralized by Treasury securities and 25% collateralized by non-Treasury are traded at 0% haircuts. In certain cases, these haircuts represent netted packages, where dealers enter into offsetting repo and reverse repo trades with their counterparties. But the differences in the haircut practices and in maturities raise important questions about how this market meets the needs of different types of counterparties. They also reinforce the need to better monitor this segment of the market for how these practices affect risks at dealers and to broader financial stability. So OFR will continue to study data from this pilot collection, collaborating with the IAWG members and the Financial Stability Oversight Council, and will share findings with the public when they're ready. And these efforts are also informing a rulemaking by the OFR to establish a permanent collection of data for this significant segment of the repo market. So let me now turn to uh, transparency to the public for the cash treasury market. And let me first briefly recap several steps that have been taken in the past few years before turning to next steps. So going back to 2017, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA, um, began collecting transaction data from its members through TRACE and providing that data to the official sector. Release of weekly aggregate volume data began to the public in March 2020, which by chance turned out to be the week with the highest reported volume since data started being collected. Then in 2021, FINRA enhanced the public release by providing more historical data back to 2019 and making changes to accommodate the reintroduction of the 20-year bond. So based on feedback from market participants, it appears this additional release of aggregate statistics has been a valuable resource. They've helped provide insight into less transparent parts of the markets, such as dealer to customer segment and off the run securities. And this past summer, the SEC pr approved another FINRA proposal to increase the frequency of releasing aggregate data from weekly to daily and to include additional statistics such as daily trade counts and average prices. And based on guidance from FINRA, who are here today, we anticipate that this new daily aggregate data will be released to the public beginning sometime in the first quarter of 2023. So given broad market participant support for the release of aggregate data, Treasury, along with the IAWG members, believed it was appropriate to consider 
additional public transparency of transaction data. To do so, Treasury published a request for information, an RFI, in June. Treasury stated in the RFI that they believed additional insight into Treasury security transactions could enhance liquidity and promote greater competition. The RFI sought input on the potential benefits and risks of additional public transparency, as well as on possible scenarios for what public transparency could look like. And as a follow-up, we also requested input from the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, TBAC. Responses to the RFI noted several potential benefits. First, additional transparency may improve investor confidence as investors could be more assured from observing executed transactions rather than indicative quotes and therefore may be more willing to remain engaged in the market. Second, additional transparency for transactions may support greater price discovery and thereby expand the supply of liquidity. RFI responses noted price data are unevenly available, may depend upon access to certain venues, costly subscriptions, or direct participation in a transaction. Respondents argued that broader access to pricing information would allow for better evaluation of execution costs and increase competition. And on this last point, several RFI responses noted academic research has generally found that post-trade transparency for other fixed income markets like corporates and mortgage-backed securities tends to increase competition and reduce transactions costs. At the same time, feedback highlighted potential risks. Most RFI responses noted that releasing information too quickly or with too much detail could end up reducing liquidity. And these risks could be particularly acute for less liquid segments of the market, such as off-the-run securities. Concerns tended to focus on the ability of intermediaries to effectively transfer risk in large size or for less liquid securities if information were to be released that could be used to trade against the intermediary. In such a scenario with greater risk of execution, end users could face higher costs. And in some worst case scenarios, such as stress episodes, respondents noted that intermediaries might be unwilling to transact at all in less liquid securities. Feedback also offered a wide range of possible paths forward, though we see some areas for consensus. For one, nearly all responses indicated that in any additional transparency should proceed gradually and that the initial focus should be on more liquid segments of the Treasury market. In addition, responses suggested that the release of information be calibrated to mitigate potential risks for large trades or for trades in less liquid segments. It was very clear that a one-size-fits-all approach was viewed as inappropriate and potentially harmful. Treasury greatly appreciates all the input we've received on this topic over the past few months. And based on the feedback, we believe that additional transparency can provide meaningful and lasting benefits on net. We also agree we should proceed in a gradual and calibrated manner. And in particular, we are proposing that the next step to release transaction data would be for on-the-run nominal coupons with end-of-day dissemination and with appropriate cap sizes. To say a bit more about this proposed policy, let me first mention why we are focused on the on-the-run nominal securities. These benchmark securities, as you know, represent the most liquid segment of the Treasury securities market, and price information for these are the fundamental reference point across many financial markets. And as you can show in figure eight, um, the line at the top is the uh, share of volume, trading volume by on the runs. It's near 80% of total. And these lines at the bottom are various off the runs. Um, providing additional transparency for the on the runs would be consistent with the feedback that data for these securities 
that transparency for these securities would have greater benefits than costs. Um, in addition, a comparison to Treasury futures suggests transparency for higher, highly liquid contracts has not hampered overall activity. And as we show in the next figure, Treasury securities cash and futures volumes on an interest rate risk basis track each other fairly closely, even in periods of stress. Second, a policy for the end of day release of transaction data stems from the fact that current FINRA rules require that transactions be reported at end of day. However, the SEC recently approved a FINRA proposal to shorten the reporting requirements to 60 minutes. And we believe eventually a shortening the period of dissemination to closer to 60 minutes would still allow sufficient time for market participants to handle large transactions in on-the-run securities. And as you can see in figure nine, data from FINRA's trace has indicated that the time in needed to trade a large block in on the runs has typically been less than 10 minutes over the past few years. So these are minutes to trade various um, maturities. Third, we agree information for very large tra trades should be released cautiously with the actual size of the trade masked at the point of dissemination, similar to practices used for other fixed income markets. At this point, the precise cap sizes will still need to be determined. However, we expect caps may be tiered based on interest rate risk profile, with initial caps set conservatively and reviewed periodically. We expect that after a sufficient period of time and experience with additional transparency for off the runs, we would consider releasing transaction data for other highly liquid tre treasury securities. Of course, any expansion would involve an evaluation of what we've learned about additional transparency on liquidity and recognizing that the benefits and costs may vary substantially with each increment. To summarize, we are proposing to provide transaction level transparency to the public in a gradual and calibrated way. We will walk, not run, in this effort. There remains details to work out, and we look forward to further engagement with IAWG members and market participants in coming months. Okay, finally, uh, there's been a lot of market attention on a potential Treasury buyback program. I want to iterate today our update on such a program from the most recent quarterly refunding announcement. Treasury continually evaluates potential debt management tools, including buybacks, that help us meet our objective of achieving the lowest cost of financing the government over time. Buybacks could have several potential uses, including liquidity support, and cash and maturity management. Treasury is gathering information on this topic from market participants, including through questions for the TBAC in August and to the primary dealers in October. We have not made any decision on whether or how to implement a buyback program, but we'll expect to share our findings on buybacks as part of future quarterly refundings. So to conclude, just want to thank everyone again for their support as Treasury and all the IAWG members work together to study and consider significant policies to improve the resilience of the Treasury market. While I see a lot of progress to date, there's clearly more ahead. We look forward to the ongoing collaboration to address these complex and critical issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Undersecretary Lang. Uh, at this time, we'll be moving to downstairs to the first floor Liberty Dining Room for lunch. Uh, so just please take the elevators outside and uh, go down to the first floor and follow signs for the dining room. Thanks.
Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Is this working? Is this working? Yeah. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you all uh, enjoyed the lunch downstairs. Um, we're going to jump straight to our second panel discussion for the day, uh, which will be focused on all-to-all -all trading. Um, and just to note that we'll, open, we'll be opening up to Q&A from the audience towards the end of the panel. Um, for this discussion, I'm going to be handing things over to Nate Werfel, who will moderate the panel. Uh, Nate Werfel is the head of domestic markets in the markets group at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he oversees the Treasury, Repo, and MBS trading desks, which implement monetary policy on behalf of the FOMC. He also oversees the bank's production of reference rates, including SOFR. Nate led the IWG's report on the flash rally in 2014 and helped found this annual Treasury Market Conference in 2015. Nate, over to you. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see all of you today, and thank you for coming. So this conference, as Ronnie just said, started uh, over eight, uh, eight years ago with a history, and it has a history of discussing the evolution of the market structure of the Treasury market. And we started with the flash rally, and then we were talking about looking back at the growth of electronic trading around the turn of the millennium. For this panel, we're going to look ahead. We're going to look forward to a topic that is, is developing in the Treasury market, all-to-all -all trading. As you may know, recently staff at the New York Fed, um, the Federal Reserve Board, and the U.S. Treasury authored a working paper titled All-to-All -All Trading in the U.S. Treasury Market. And through a series of structured conversations with market participants, the authors distilled views on some of the potential benefits of all-to-all -all trading such as improved market resilience, lower transaction costs, and improved transparency. They also highlighted some of the different perspectives on the challenges of all-to-all -all trading, including some potential limitations it might face in less liquid parts of the market, the concentration of clearing and settlement risk with trading platforms, and the risk that changes in market structure can bring, bring changes to the competitive landscape. One of the key findings of that paper is that all-to-all -all trading takes many different forms. Of course, in its ideal state, it would be anybody around the world could trade with another person around the world, but in practice, it takes on many different shapes, whether that's in particular market segments or with different types of trading protocols. And I think we'll hear about the variety of those today. We've brought together representatives from the market and academia to provide their perspectives on these trade-offs and the trajectory of all-to-all -all trading. As is befitting of a topic called all-to-all -all trading, we have a very big and inclusive panel. <laughs> or, as, or as Tom Pluta said, the world's largest panel. <laughs> um, so let me briefly introduce our panelists. First, uh, Daryl Duffy to my right is the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management and Professor of Finance at Stanford. He is also a research fellow of the NBER and a leading member of the team that wrote the recent G30 report on US Treasury market resilience. Nicola Hunter is the global head of fixed income sales at TPICAP. She's responsible for supporting the expansion of the fixed income business globally, including for LiquidNet's buy side network and TPICAP's community of sell side dealers. We have Tom Pluta to her right. He's president elect at TradeWeb Markets, where he also serves on the board of directors. Tom joined TradeWeb last month, coming from JP Morgan, where he was the global head of linear rates trading. Isaac Chang is the head of central execution for global fixed income at Citadel. He manages relationships with counterparties and trading venues and oversees teams that focus on execution, trading, and research, working capital management, and market intelligence. Priya Misra is the managing director and global head of rate strategy at TD Securities. She's responsible for the firm's macro calls on the US and global interest rate markets and publishes extensively on research on interest rates. Rick Chan is the Managing Director and a Portfolio Manager at PIMCO, where he focuses on PIMCO's global macro hedge fund strategies and relative value trading and interest rate markets. And finally, we have Rick McVeigh, who is the Chairman and CEO at Market Access, which he founded back in April of 2000. Market Access provides a leading, a leading electronic uh, platform for corporate bonds, bringing together institutional investors and broker-dealer firms to trade a broad range of credit products. So thank you all for joining us. So the way we're going to work this panel, given the, its size um, and the interest in this topic, I'm going to go through three key questions. And, and for those three questions, I'm going to ask a subset of the panel to speak to them. And then after we go through those three core questions, we're going to open it up for some vigorous debate. Those three questions. First, why do you think all-to-all -all trading has not become more widespread in the Treasury market, as we have seen in some other markets? 
Second, do you think that broader adoption of all-to-all -all trading would be on net beneficial or detrimental to the treasury market? And third, what do you see as being the key factors in the potential broader adoption of all-to-all -all trading? So let's start with the first question. Why do you think all-to-all -all trading has not become more widespread in the treasury market? Maybe for some context, I think most people know the treasury market's bifurcated between the inner-dealer space and the dealer-to-client space. And actually, in that inner-dealer space, you have something of an all-to-all -all market between dealers and with principal trading firms. And then, of course, in the dealer-to-client space, you have more dealer-centric trading over different protocols, sometimes voice, sometimes electronic. And this is in contrast to some other markets where, for example, equities and futures, where we've seen almost nearly all electronic trading in very large, uh, uh, with wide set of trading partners. So maybe, Daryl, to start with you, um, why did the treasury market end up this way? Is this some sort of unique feature of the treasury market? Or is it just sort of a random walk, random chance that we've landed here? Thanks, Nate. Uh, well, I, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, first of all, I don't think we're necessarily stuck here. Uh, <laughs> well, I think one of the reasons we're talking about this today is that the benefits that are in that report, that New York Fed staff report that you described, <clears throat> are large, but they're not necessarily large enough to have overcome in the past the reluctance of uh, some market participants uh, to lean in on all-to-all -all trade. Uh, for example, you know, it might be not in the interest of some dealers to disintermediate themselves by supporting all-to-all -all trade. They have to compete harder, and they'd lose some market share where investors could meet each other directly. So that's one reason. Uh, I'm gonna talk about also some impediments in the current market structure that might mitigate that uh, if we had them, like central clearing or uh, post-trade price transparency. Uh, but those were always a problem. What's changed? Uh, what's changed is that, as has been mentioned by President Williams and by Under Secretary Liang uh, this morning, the treasury market has grown by leaps and bounds. It's, it's about three times as big and outstanding as it was uh, on the eve of the financial crisis. And yet, the dealer balance sheets and the dealers intermediate essentially 100% of investor trade have not grown commensurate with that. They've barely grown at all. Uh, since the financial crisis. So as has been widely reported, we've got this imbalance now where it, on episodic events like uh, spring of 2020 when COVID became a pandemic, <clears throat> the flood of requests for liquidity overwhelmed the space available on dealer balance sheets. And that's a change. And that's why I said we're here today discussing this. Uh, we could mitigate uh, that problem with uh, changes in capital regulations that have limited the growth in dealer balance sheet space like the SLR, which we're probably going to hear more about today. <clears throat> My view is that'll help, but even if you take SLR entirely out of the picture, we're still not going to have enough dealer balance sheet space to intermediate the market entirely through by uh, trading through dealer balance sheets. So all to all trade could become a solution that you all would go for. Why can't we jump into it right now? Well, there are some impediments. First, you know, if you build it, will they come? Will quote providers come to these all to all trade platforms and provide quotes aggressively. I already mentioned there might be some reluctance uh, of dealers to disintermediate themselves. And uh, we know from research that, uh, let's say uh, Rick McVeigh's market access platform, you really need dealers. It's uh, some recent research by uh, Norman Scherhoff, Dimitri Livdan, and Terry Hendershot shows that when you build these all to all platforms, you still rely very heavily on dealers uh, to come and provide quotes. Uh, so will they come? Secondly, the quote providers need price transparency in order not to get picked off on these platforms. And in off-the-runs, as we've discussed today, under Secretary Liang mentioned, the off-the-run market is relatively illiquid. Uh, you might worry, if you haven't seen the latest prices in this market, about getting picked off when you provide quotes on these platforms. So I would say post-trade price transparency and off-the-run market go naturally with bringing in all-to-all -all trade. And then finally, we also discussed today central clearing, or we, you know, we had a healthy discussion of central clearing, and it's difficult to introduce all-to-all -all trade without central clearing. First, if you don't have straight through processing into central clearing, it becomes more difficult to offer that as an attractive opportunity. And secondly, I, I, I don't know, but I don't think the official sector would be all that happy if all-to-all -all trade took off like a rocket, but there was no central counterparty ensuring safe settlement. If it were centrally cleared de facto, on the balance sheet of the platform provider, as happens today in the interdealer market, 
That's not a solution. So all of these things go together. I don't think we're going to get all-to-all -all trade until some of these other uh, things happen as well. And how to order those, I don't know, but fortunately, you guys are on the job. Thanks, Daryl. Over to you, Nicola. I think the bottom line is it's hard. Uh, it's absolutely hard to establish all tool trading in this market. And it's not as though the market hasn't tried already. I can think of at least two very well-funded startup venues in the last seven years that have opened their doors and then shut their doors and failed uh, to get all tool trading off the ground, which underpinned their, uh, their launch philosophy. So why is it? Um, I mean, we know that we effectively operate three markets the primary market, the dealer-to-dealer -dealer market, and the dealer-to-customer market. And across those three markets are a myriad of protocols and trading mechanisms and technology-driven uh, technology products which enable trading. So we have clubs, we have the RFQ, we have sweeps and auctions, we have streams, and we have good old bilateral negotiation, which we know is the dominant protocol, if I can even call it a protocol, in the most liquid, illiquid end of the market where I think we have possibly the biggest problem and the biggest challenge on our hands. Within these protocols, there's not one size that fits all. Uh, and there's not one thing that satisfies the needs of all participants. So is it possible to have a homogenous protocol that everyone can participate in? I don't think so. Um, but because the treasury market is a, has, a, uh, has a huge diverse participant mix, there are natural conflicts with these protocols, which mean all-to-all -all trading hasn't, hasn't been able to take off. So how do, how do I illustrate that? So uh, the, the um, inter-dealer market trades in million dollar one, uh, uh, one million dollar round lots. The dealer to customer markets has to trade right down to the dollar. The clubs don't facilitate their ability to, uh, to mix and match that participant participation. All are non-trading versus partial, be able to support partial fills, certainty of execution versus missed opportunity. And of course, what we hear a lot, and I even heard it at my uh, lunch table today, relationship, the importance of relationship versus anonymity, which dominates, uh, uh, which dominates many of the, uh, uh, the protocols. And then Lastly, but no means least, is the importance of technology in our market and how this has evolved in, the, uh, in the, last, uh, the last few years. In order to adopt new protocols and to, and to um, embrace new venues and new ways of trading, you need to, technology needs to adapt and evolve. And I think one of the biggest barriers to all-to-all -all trading in the market is, is habit and change, is the ability to embrace innovation and change, specifically on the buy side and the, uh, and the way that the um, OMS and workflow has to, uh, needs to evolve in order to uh, adapt uh, anything other than the dealer to client uh, uh, flow. That's great. Um, Tom, you have some views on this? Yeah, thanks, Nate. <clears throat> I have three points to make. First, um, my view on why um, all to all has not caught on in the treasury market to date um, is because there's already a wide range of existing protocols um, that suit the, the, the diversity and, and range of participants in the market, and it's been, it's been perfectly sufficient. Um, and there has been innovation over the years. There have been new protocols that have been introduced. Um, for example, at TradeWeb today, across our institutional, wholesale, and retail liquidity pools, there's at least eight different ways that you could trade treasuries. So it's everything from RFQ, directed bilateral streams, um, either anonymous or disclosed, um, session trades, list trades, um, and, our central little, and our central limit order book, and there's a few others. Um, additionally, um, we have an algorithmic trading protocol known as AIX. That's something that's grown very significantly in the last several years, and that gives clients more control over how and when to execute their orders. So there's been a ton of innovation. We're continuing to innovate, and we work very closely with the buy side and dealers to continue to bring new protocols to market. Um, second point I want to make, there's a lot of reference that's made to the credit market, the US credit market potentially as a blueprint for how the treasury market could evolve to all to all. But I think it's very important to understand that there are 
very significant differences between credit and treasuries with respect to um, with respect to structure and function of the market. For example, um, in credit, there's tens of thousands of QCIPs. In the treasury market, there's 300 or so, with seven of those trading 80% of the volume on any given day, on average, the seven on the runs. That's a big difference. Um, ticket size, um, much smaller in credit. It's about 20% of the, the average ticket size compared to the treasury market. Um, retail participation. 35% in credit, 8% in treasuries. And finally, um, the time to quote an RFQ is dramatically different. In the treasury market, an RFQ is requested and done in less than three seconds. In credit, that process takes 20 minutes. So the point is, um, the credit market lends itself much better to an all-to-all -all format. I think that's why that market has evolved more, more quickly. Um, but despite all this, even in the credit market, and we saw from the Fed paper from a few weeks ago, even in the credit market, only about 12% of the volume in credit goes through all-to-all -all protocols, and only 2% of that is buy side to buy side. And that was 2018. I think it's a little bit higher now, but not materially, uh, not materially different. So when I think about all-to-all -all and treasuries and what it could look like, I view it as a protocol that could coexist alongside all of these other protocols that, that are functioning well today. Um, it's not gonna be a one size, a one size fit all approach. Um, now that said, TradeWeb is well positioned to um, succeed in the development of these trading protocols and look forward to working with clients and dealers on that if the demand is there. Um, third and final point I wanna make is another very unique thing about the US Treasury market is the primary dealer model. That's very unique, right? So. Primary dealers have an explicit obligation to bid on every auction, in aggregate, up to, take, up to a, a, an amount that would take down the full amount of the auction. Um, they also have an implicit obligation to um, participate in the secondary markets every day, regardless of market conditions. So I think that as we're talking about all to all, as we're talking about a number of the other topics on treasury market structure reform, it's really important that we make sure that we preserve um, the primary dealer model and understand the impacts on the primary de dealer model. Um, so let me move on to our second question, which was, do you think the broader adoption of all-to-all -all trading would on net be beneficial or detrimental to the treasury market? I realize that's sort of a stark question and it probably is various shades of gray, but to, to begin the discussion, we already heard some of it already, um, different points of view. Um, I mentioned some of the benefits that um, we've heard in outreach, and, and I'm sure you all have heard as well, improving market uh, liquidity, connecting a wider range of buyers and sellers together, sort of bypassing any potential intermediation frictions. On the other hand, um, concerns about whether it would increase or reduce liquidity provision um, by intermediaries or could make market prices in depth more susceptible to shocks in times of stress. Um, so maybe Isaac, I'd like to hear from you. What's your view on this question? Sure, thanks, Nate. Um, look, I'd start with maybe a few observations from someone whose teams have to sort of participate in the trenches of treasury trading every day. I, I, sort of two, 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 two points or two observations came to mind. I was thinking about how to answer this question. So one is, you know, we have a very regular review process with all of our key dealers. We sit down with all the senior people at, you know, all of our, our, our the banks that we view as our strategic partners and you know, without fail, every single meeting, a significant portion of time is spent discussing what is now the alphabet soup of regulatory constraints. SACCR was hot this year. Uh, how many RWAs people have to shed to get in the right GSIB bucket before the end of the year? Um, no one's saying capital, they have more capital than they know what to do with. Everyone's talking and complaining about how constrained they are and how limited resources are. So that's sort of the backdrop that, that I think we face as an investing community as we try and invest money uh, that our investors give us. Uh, and you know, I think that applies really kind of up and down the, you know, I don't think this is a unique situation to one dealer. I think it's, pretty, it's a pretty common uh, occurrence for us. You know, on a more regular basis, nearly every day, my team is either electronically or in chats or once in a while old school picking up the phone 
with dealers trying to transact in generally what would be considered liquid vanilla rates markets, treasuries, but others too, interest rate, interest rate swaps, European government bonds, um, and so forth. And, and you know, more often than I would expect, I would say, you know, nearly every day, we do lots and lot, we do have lots and lots of, of trades to do, but we get a response along the lines of, sorry, doesn't fit, can't show a price, or need to pass, desk is full on that risk, and, you know, even once in a while we get apologies, traders on there too weaker, right? So, so this is the, this is the, this, this is, the, the, this is sort of the reality. So you combine that with, I mean, the bottom line, I think, is that even the very largest dealers have made a very conscious decision and business model choice that they can't and will not be all things to all people. And given that reality and given the fact that the treasury market has grown, I think Professor Duffy gave these stats, the ones I read was at the end of 2007, treasury debt held by the public was 5.1 trillion and by the end of 2021 it reached 23.2 trillion. It seems to me it's obvious that we need alternative mechanisms for market participants to transfer risk in a more efficient manner. A recent uh, coalition Greenwich report pointed out that today only about 30% of overall tre tre treasury trading volume is what traditionally would be classified as dealer to dealer. Where in 2013 it was about 43%, and 2001 it was roughly half, about 49%. I mean, the dealer community is just smaller as a fraction of the overall market than what maybe some people nostalgically think of as the good old days. And so we consider our deal dealers our strategic partners. We value the liquidity and the services and resources they provide. Uh, but experience, we think, from other markets and asset classes also show that different models of risk transfer can thrive alongside each other, and we're not arguing for an all or nothing switch. But no one thinks that, we certainly don't think that's realistic. Um, but we also, I mean, I think another point worth making is all to all doesn't just mean central limited order book trading. Treasury market, as everyone, most people, I'm sure everyone in this room knows, consists of a wide range of securities with many, with very widely varying liquidity characteristics. And so, I think this has been said, there's not a one size fits all model, right? For the most liquid or on the runs, a central order book might work just fine. For less liquid parts of the curve, historically RFQ has, has, has sufficed, but I think we also need to be open to exploring other options. For in some markets, to concentrate liquidity, particularly in less liquid securities, sort of various flavors of periodic auctions uh, uh, have achieved some success. You know, I thought about this point that Nate raised in, in the question, which was, is that in, in, if, uh, if there was an all-to-all -all model, that, uh, that ex a more of a prevalent all-to-all -all model that existed, would current dealers pull back and make, more, make markets more susceptible to shocks in times of stress? You know, to me, I, that doesn't match with the actual experience, I think, has been either in treasuries or other, other, other markets, right? I mean, what, what did we see in 2020? What did we see in 2008? Dealers did pull back. They had to, right? It made sense. They have fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to deploy capital in a responsible manner. They, they did what they should have done. They, they pulled back. But in those kinds of environments, I, I think, that doesn't, I mean, I think there, there need to be other, there need, we need to have other channels by which you can transfer risk in, in the treasury secondary market, in the secondary treasury market. Um, you know, and if, you, if we're saying that the net result of introducing more all-to-all -all trading reduces transaction costs for market participants, I'd kind of argue by definition you're making the market more efficient. Um, and in every market that I'm aware of, when transaction costs go down, volumes go up. Strategies that were marginal or couldn't overcome transaction costs before become viable. Um, and so, lastly, I'd just say, like, I, don't, I wouldn't say that all to all trading is a panacea that fixes every issue with the market. I don't think there's any one silver bullet that does that. But there's an interplay between a number of these proposals that I think needs to be appreciated. Right? Central clearing not only reduces counterparty risk, and settlement risk, but it eliminates the need for bilateral trading agreements before market participants. It's something that would, I mean, at this point's been made, but would clearly facilitate uh, increased all-to-all -all trading. Increased transparency helps unlock the ability of more market participants to provide liquidity. Uh, to me, at the end of the day, it's a no-brainer that a market with a broader, more diversified ecosystem of both counterparties and means of execution would produce, would, would improve treasury market resilience and liquidity. Thanks, Isaac.
uh, Priya, um, Daryl opened up by talking a little bit about dealers and their views on all-to-all -all trading, but also pointed out that in, even in all-to-all -all markets, dealers play, liquidity providers play important roles. So you must be very um, positive about uh, all-to-all -all developments. So, so you <laughs> asked a very direct question, whether it would help, whether all-to-all -all would be detrimental or beneficial to resilience. And at the risk of oversimplifying, and you're right, I, the one dealer, I guess, on this panel, I'm actually going to say it's going to hurt, it's going to be detrimental to resilience. The operative word is resilience, right? I think we all talked about the constraints the dealer community is facing, and I'm not suggesting all or none, that the ecosystem has to move entirely from the current many protocol system to all to all, 100% all to all. But as we think about expanding the all to all protocol, and at least that's, that's the debate today, I think we should consider that the, the benefits come from a smaller role that primary dealers play in the treasury market intermediation or in the uh, risk transfer process. I think what we're debating is primary dealers will play an even smaller role. And I think we should consider three points on this. Number one, when there are stress times, which is why I go back to resilience, not liquidity on average, resilience, stress times. You know, March of 2020 has been talked about, but there are plenty of stress times. I think all of us who've been looking at the treasury market this year, there have been many stress days this year, uh, 2008. There have been other episodes when people who buy treasuries and, and investors buy, I mean, we, in the earlier panel, we talked about the diversity of people who buy treasuries. People buy treasuries for liquidity. The convenience yield has been well researched. They buy treasuries so that in times of stress, I can liquidate these treasuries, large amounts of treasuries. Nobody really thinks of those corporate bonds as giving me that much liquidity. So it's in these times of stress that large transactions have to go through. And then we have to think about an environment where it may be a one-sided flow. 2020 was one example, but there have been many other examples. There's a central bank uh, you know, action that was higher or less than market pricing. You can have, there's, there's economic data surprise. You have one-sided flow. I'm not sure how all to all, because you may not have the other side at that time existing. So I think in stress times, we have to think that the market resilience would be more challenged. Not just stress times, let me also talk about the less liquid parts of the treasury market. So off the runs, strips, tips. Um, I would even say bills at certain times, um, where, you know, the trading volumes are much less. Under Secretary uh, Liang showed how much time it takes for the market to clear. How, how many volumes exist in these uh, securities or this part, the, this part of the market? How long does it take dealers to um, get rid of this position? The need for warehousing. I mean, I go back to your first question, Nate. Why hasn't the all-to-all -all market worked? It's been tried, it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked because and I was not on your lunch table, Nicola, but there is a value of relationship. Now I'm gonna sound like a salesperson, but this is a trust business. Um, you know, if I trust my counterparty, I have to, or I trust my dealer, I have to do a big trade in and off the run that I know the dealer might be wearing for days on end, I might want to show it to that dealer. Um, I mean, there's informational value. There's a, so I would say for the on the run market where enough liquidity exists, maybe you, it's harder to appreciate this value. In the off-the-run market, in certain other markets, I think it's important. And then I guess uh, uh, somebody brought up uh, auctions. And you know, 2020, uh, yes, dealers pulled back. The auction process went smooth, right? We've had auctions. The US Treasury is a predictable, unlike the corporate bond market, which shuts down, the primary market shuts down every time volatility picks up. The US Treasury comes in with very large auctions in a predictable fashion, I haven't seen the treasury having to change that because of market functioning, because of the role of the primary dealers. So I don't want to overemphasize this point, but I think there is a, we should debate what's the role of a primary dealer as we're debating moving to an all to all, and does liquidity just migrate from the current different protocols to, and it's the same amount of liquidity, we're not actually expanding, growing the, or, I don't know, growing the pipe, I guess, um, are we just migrating it from one set of pipes to another set of pipes? And so I struggle with, does it actually expand capacity? I don't, I'm not sure all to all expands capacity in times of stress among these products and in auctions where the dealers have a mandate to come in and bid at the auction. Um, so, you know, I would say um, price impact of, and we've had some, lots of great studies, there was one published by Liberty Street yesterday, price impact of trades this year, you can see it's much higher. 
And that's because the dealer community is constrained. And so, you know, I would say we should consider, and I'm, hopefully the next panel will address SLR, so I won't go on on that, but is there a way to expand capacity of the dealer community? And then, you know, should the ecosystem have an all-to-all -all along with the dealer? I think that's really what we need to debate as opposed to uh, thinking about resilience in this all-to-all -all market where the treasury market, I would say just the, the, the reason it exists or, or the, the, the reason that people buy it may not work in, you know, it, it's not one, so we talked a lot about, it's not one size fits all. And I would say we should appreciate that people buy treasuries for different reasons and they need the ability to transact really quickly with minimum price impact. So I guess I'm a little skeptical that it'll do much for resilience, but I'll see what others have to say. Back to you. Thank you, Priya. Uh, let's turn to our third question. So the third question was, what do you see as the key factors in the potential broader adoption of all-to-all -all trading? In the staff report, that the New York Fed staff report that came out, it identified a couple of factors that market participants talked about. One was counter around counterparty credit risk, um, that for counterparty credit risk and business reasons, most current and former trading venues in the treasury market are the legal counterparty to trades. Um, and these arrangements uh, result in costly and uh, credit, uh, counterparty credit risk management uh, mechanisms and entail some risk. Um, the second thing that they identified was around data and transparency that many existing trading venues have been successful only in on the run uh, treasury securities where data and pricing availability is high. So let me ask Rick and Rick um, your views on, on these two or other factors that might be necessary preconditions or, or uh, uh, important factors in the development of all to all trading. So Rick Chan. Yeah, so I, I think you know, for clearing, um, clearing is you know, if you put all your transactions through one venue, clearing helps with the credit component, that's, that's clear. Um, but it won't necessarily spur all to all trading. I, I think you know, um, all to all trading, I think a key component of is it to be fair for all participants, right? And it's one of those things like LIBOR where it's very difficult to get the whole industry to move to something without a private public partnership. And I think, you know, the, you know, the instances where all to all tried to take off, the rules of the game and the all to all platforms were different for different participants. And I think if we move to an area where we are trying to make a more resilient treasury market structure, moving to a platform that isn't fair for all will be a mistake. So our view has always been to make sure that any venue um, that's related to all to all is fair for all participants. I think the other thing that keeps coming up is you know, um, data and transparency. And everything we talk about generally is post-trade transparency. I think the issue with the off the run bond market is pre-trade transparency. Um, dealers as well as customers have a very difficult time knowing where off the run securities are. So I think, you know, without the pre-trade transparency, the post-trade transparency off the run, for off the run bonds becomes a little more problematic. Because what happens is uh, when a customer asks a dealer for a quote on an off the run bond securities, similar to what happened in March of 2020, because the information is so readily available and it doesn't transact on a regular basis, people can triangulate what people's positions are. There is a forced deleveraging, there's a need of cash these 10 QCIPs are now likely the ones will be under stress. The market then just reprices uh, very quickly without any transactions actually taking place. So I think, you know, so how do we kind of bridge that gap? Because we are not in an all to all marketplace and how do we get from point A to point B? I think one of the most natural progressions is to basically have some type of platform that encourages more pre-trade market transparency. Not necessarily, you know, quotes that aren't honored, like firm pricing. And as time progresses, as more data is available, I think then we can kind of, you know, um, create a better system and, you know, move to a more inclusive marketplace. Um, because like a lot of the panelists have said, dealers are just much smaller proportion of outstanding treasuries um, now than they were, you know, 15 years ago. So I think, you know, Getting more participants to participate um, will help, um, but the you know the repo consideration is also huge. Like, why doesn't you know more participants participate in the treasury market? Well, the notionals are large, even though it's T plus one settle. The barriers to entry to enter the treasury market are high, especially for off the run bonds where you know you are unlikely to be able to liquidate that position in the same day. 
So the current market structure um, for on the runs is very, you know, has similar features to a clob because you, you believe that you're able to execute your or close your position out with the, within the day. If you have an off the run bond position, you're unlikely going to close that position out within the day. You're going to have to keep it on your balance sheet, which means you have to have a large balance sheet um, because you're going to have an off the run bond versus an on the run or an off the run bond versus versus a future. So I think you know those three aspects are you know very crucial um, in order for all to all adoption to take place. But I think you know what can we do in the meantime? I think you know, pre-trade price, you know, transparency or pre-trade uh, price discovery is, is, is very important. Thanks, thanks, Rick. Uh, Rick McVeigh, you have been running a trading platform that provides all-to-all -all services. So what does it take to do this in the treasury market? Well, happy to uh, <clears throat> share the story of our journey in credit and some of what I see as the, the common themes in treasuries. And this is a little bit of deja vu because this same uh, liquidity problem started to emerge in corporate bonds and other parts of credit about a dozen years ago. And uh, some of you will remember that um, uh, BlackRock took a stand on the importance of market structure modernization and credit uh, back around 2011 and wrote a white paper about uh, structural changes, including all to all trading that would improve uh, the resiliency of the market. Uh, and it was about that time that Market Access started down the journey of offering our clients uh, access to all to all liquidity. And I, you know, so that's, um, there are a couple of things that, uh, that stand out. First, uh, the earlier panel dealt with central clearing and um, it's come up uh, throughout the day today. And I would say central clearing in the long term is likely to provide some benefits to market participants, but it's not a prerequisite for all to all trading. Uh, most of the trading venues operate as broker-dealers and many of us as ATS as well. And broker-dealers know how to settle trades. So whether they do that directly uh, through FIC or DTCC or do that through a, a settlement partner, uh, we have the capacity to settle those trades uh, through our broker-dealer. Uh, the other thing I would say is that critical mass on trading venues is essential to making alt all even possible. And I don't know any large client uh, that we deal with around the world that wants all to all liquidity in replacement of dealer liquidity. They want it in addition to dealer liquidity. Uh, so it's not that they're saying we want to go student body right and do something totally different. They're stay, saying the world has changed where the outstanding debt is significantly higher, whether it's rates or credit around the world. And let's all admit there are significant capital constraints on traditional dealer balance sheets. So what the asset managers want is access to both. So we started with a very simple concept at a point in time in our evolution where we had already established critical mass uh, with participating dealers and lots of asset managers around the world with a very simple concept, which is it is the client's choice when they have an RFQ going out on market access to determine the audience that they want to share that order with. So if they want to share it with a handful of dealers or 20 dealers or our entire network, uh, our philosophy has been that that should be the client's choice. So if there's client demand for alternative sources of liquidity and you offer that choice, uh, you can start down the path of augmenting traditional dealer liquidity with all to all liquidity. Uh, and that's exactly what we've done. So if you fast forward to where we are today, about 20% of the U.S. high-grade market and 20% of the U.S. high-yield market transacts through the market access system each day. Almost all of those orders are available to the entire network. Uh, some of the stats that I, I think Tom was referring to are 37% of our orders achieve the best price through a non-traditional liquidity provider. So 63% of the time, a dealer is providing the best price 37% of the time, in some of those, there is no dealer price. There's an alternative market maker, a dealer that doesn't have a relationship with that client, or another client that provides the best price on that trade. So it's a significant part of the corporate bond market, and it's been growing over the last five years at about 30% uh, compound growth rate, and it's become a very important source of new liquidity in the market. Um, I will go back uh, to the other point that we talked about a couple times today, which is transparency. I personally don't think this would have been possible without Trace. Uh, and Trace has been around since 2002. Uh, but it's very hard to um, compel alternative market makers that do not have 
access to existing business to commit capital unless they have a trade tape and transparency. So Trace has been a big part of this. And uh, I personally think that it was designed effectively so that there are cap trade sizes, uh, 5 million in investment grade corporates, 1 million in high yield, that are designed to make sure that the pricing is available to the market. It, in, it increases the likelihood that new market entrants will come in and commit capital to these markets, but it doesn't disrupt or harm the block trading liquidity that dealers are still to this day providing the bulk of. And I think those compromises can be achieved on the Treasury trace tape as well. One last point, too, that I would say is that the reason I don't think that this has been a topic until recently is what we consistently heard 12 years ago from large asset managers was the problem was in credit and they had sufficient traditional dealer liquidity in treasuries. Treasury market now has some of the same challenges, right? It's significantly bigger than it was seven or eight years ago. And so this is why the conversation is coming up now. But uh, the transparency to me is critical to get new market participants feeling like uh, they have the information they need to commit capital. They're dealing on a level playing field and we've seen a substantial increase in market participation and new, new liquidity providers in credit. And I think just one, one other stat that I would point out is that uh, it does definitely broaden and diversify the liquidity pool. And while asset managers are not typically price makers, they are when they see a match that fits the portfolio needs that they are trying to fill. So we looked the other day, and if you look at year to date, here we are in early November, we have had 1,000 different firms provide liquidity on market access in corporate bonds. So just think about how different that world is in terms of diversifying the pool of liquidity and making the market more resilient at times of stress which is exactly the time when these problems become larger because the capital constraints become very real. Uh, so I think transparency is a key part of it, uh, trading venues with critical mass so that you have more matching opportunities and providing the right incentives so that it's not one or the other, it's dealer liquidity and alternative sources of liquidity in the same pool. Thank you, thank you all. So I, I wanna just continue this conversation and open it up to the other panelists briefly. Maybe you can do a, a one minute sound bite on what is your view on data or central clearing as a precondition to additional forms of all to all trading. Any, any one of you wanna take, take that up? I can be brief. I wanted to talk about the risks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say all for transparency. I just think we have to be careful in the, the illiquid parts of the market um, because if warehousing and I think you know, this has been brought up a few times. If dealers have to warehouse it, we need balance sheet, and it takes a while to get those positions to distribute, redistribute that position. That risk transfer will become much harder if that inform information is out before somebody can actually get out of that position. So I still struggle a little bit with the off the run, but all about pre-trade. I just don't know pre-trade in the off the run market that doesn't trade that often is a is a it's a great uh, us like world peace i would love it i just don't know how you get there yeah so i think i think you know if you have post trade without pre trade that is for a, a, a liquid market that's your bigger concern because what happens is you don't know where the where the true price was something then shows up and if you're planning to continue to trade in that and you only have 10% of your size done then that becomes a problem because then the whole market knows which, which direction it is. And usually the price will dictate what the size is, very similar to like treasury futures block trades. When it shows up on the, on the tape, the price moves very quickly and everybody kind of knows the direction purely because you know what, what, the, what the print or the price print was. So for a, a less liquid market, you know, I, I think you know, pre-trade you know, is important and I think you have to do small steps encourage more smaller transactions, then kind of using the credit example, market participants will gain more comfort. And I don't think it will happen overnight. I think it's a slow moving process. Um, but I think you know that's kind of the first step in order to have firm, smaller transactions take place um, to get more market participants to be, feel comfortable with it. So let me go to Daryl first and then, and then over to Tom to talk about some risks unless you wanted to hit on transparency and uh, uh, central clearing, Isaac. But first to, to Daryl. Yeah, I would, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, something we haven't mentioned yet is uh, matching efficiently dealers to trades. So when you have price transparency and someone gives you a quote that's away from the prices you're seeing elsewhere in the market, whether pre-trade or post-trade, 
you know that that dealer is overloaded or uh, insufficient on that particular security. If you don't have the price transparency, you're not going to know that you should not match with this dealer. You should go to another dealer. So uh, tr um, efficient matching will make better use of the available balance sheets of dealers, whether or not you're using all to all trade. As it so real quick, from a clearing perspective, I actually think I mean, we've been talking about clearing of of of, of transactions, but I actually think. Um, and I, this, this came on the, 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 uh, the earlier panel, but I think clearing a repo uh, actually would be very beneficial for unlocking increased participation and, and sort of a wider diverse client base. I mean, at the end of the day, treasuries, I mean, in general, are not necessarily this year all the time, in general, less volatile assets than, say, something like equities, right? And so to generate the same returns on the same asset base, you need, you need some amount of leverage. Now, to do that, you need financing capacity. And I think the challenge today is that in the financing market, I think that we find is often that it's a cliff. It's not just price. Obviously, price is a function, but, but because of the constraint, dealers will say you can get a billion and no more, right? There's no price at which you can get more than a billion because they have a GSIB buffer, their capital reserve goes up. There, there's, there's no way they can make that economical. Right? If you created a central clearing model for, for repo, where there may not be, there are going to be increased costs, the haircuts, margin. No, I'm not going to argue that that's the case, not won't be the case. But I think then you actually create a continuous function for, for, for financing. I actually would argue you would be able to introduce new participants into the treasury market that, that previously wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to, wouldn't, wouldn't been able to participate. And it's because of the, just the, the inherent volatility of, of the instruments and, and the comparative uh, need to generate returns. So, so from a clearing perspective, I actually think clearing of repo, it would, I, I mean, we're definitely, we are definitely in favor of, of clearing of secondary transactions as well, but clearing of repo could be even more impactful. And I, anyway, I just want to underscore, I think sort of the essence of Rick's point is, I think we can all just think of a world that functions a lot better that has a lot of different features. But I think there's a path of getting from here to there that we have to be careful about and thoughtful about, right? How do we get from point A to point B? This is the US Treasury market. We don't wanna be, uh, we don't wanna break anything. And so there's a, we do need to be very thoughtful about how we sequence these things. And I think he made, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, I'd agree with him there. I do think that, um, it, but you know, again, in general, I do think more trans and understanding how do you get to that pre-trade price discovery, right? It's not, not maybe not even transparency; it's discovery. When something doesn't trade a lot, how do you, and it, again, like I kind of go back. I think you, we need to be creative about thinking about how do you find ways to concentrate interest at any point in time. But I'd also argue you get more pre-trade price discovery when you have more market participants. And I do think clearing of repo uh, and expanding as a result access to to treasury market leverage would be. Uh, a, 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 a very beneficial uh, factor. So, Tom, you want to weigh in here? Yeah, I just <clears throat> kind of wanted to go back and highlight another risk that I've been thinking about. So, as I mentioned earlier, I feel that, okay, some of these protocols get introduced and take off. I think there'll be one or two all to all protocols alongside all the others that exist because everyone has different needs. Great. But what if I'm wrong, right? So, let's imagine a world for a second where there's one big liquidity pool. It's everybody's in it, it's anonymous, it's centrally cleared, and everybody can trade with anybody else, okay? So um, the risk that I'm thinking about is that is gonna completely change the economics for a dealer because you have customers coming to you as a dealer to make your price via whatever method, but they have the access to the same liquidity pool that you do, right? So that's gonna change the value proposition for dealers significantly. Now, um, will it impact the top five or six dealers? Probably not, I think they can still compete, but I think what it could exacerbate is a trend that's already been in place that to me is worrisome where the volumes in treasuries, the dealer volumes in treasuries are more and more and more concentrated in the top five or six dealers. So what could happen in that world is second tier, third tier dealers struggle to compete, struggle to make money, and potentially pull back or drop out completely. So you could end up in a situation where you have less aggregate, aggregate liquidity. And I think it really does beg the question, in that type of world, what is the value of being a primary dealer? And I think that's something that Fed and the Treasury and all of us need to think about very carefully 
as we wade into some of these changes. Nicola, you want to weigh in? Just to pick up, up, off, up on what Tom was saying, I don't think uh, we should look at all-to-all -all trading through the prism of one giant pool that everybody needs to participate in. I think that's unrealistic, and I, I think it will be detrimental uh, for the market. I think we need to look at it in terms of the network effect. How do we create the network effect across the different protocols and market microstructures that already exist within, uh, within the marketplace? without too much concentration risk in, say, a market access being the only platform, for instance, where we can create that network effect, or a trade web, for instance, or a Bloomberg. There are, there are a number of market participants out there who can facilitate all-to-all uh, -all trading, and most specifically for a PIMCO to potentially meet a, meet a BlackRock. And I think, um, uh, I think that's where we should be focusing on in terms of continuing to build the network effect without a one-size-fits-all giant pool that we're all participating in. So I'm going to ask you each a yes-no question, or all of you a yes-no question. An increase in all-to-all -all trading will increase the resilience of the market in times of stress. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think Surprise. I could have predicted those answers, so that was great. Okay, I want to I wanna open it up. We have time for about two questions from the audience, so I'm going to open it up now to audience members to ask a question. Uh, so let's see if anybody's got one. Right here. Will you take an, ob will you take an observation as opposed to a question? Sure. So, but it has to be as short as a question. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, try to, I'll keep it really short. <laughs> buy side traders and dealers um, approach the market differently. Buy side traders tend to want to get their trade done, where dealers are afraid of the adverse selection of they don't want to do the trades that would hurt them. So the consequence of that is that buy side traders will narrow spreads, whereas uh, dealers have to have spreads which means that buy side can displace the, uh, the dealers and will end up losing dealers. And so now the question is, are we worse off when we lose the dealers under the circumstances? And the answer is, when the buy side is providing liquidity that displaces the dealers, we've lost the dealer's liquidity, but we get the buy side liquidity and we're, we're, we're ahead of the game in the end. Anybody want to react to that? <laughs> so I can react a little bit uh, to that. I mean, I, I, I see your point entirely. The, the, you're talking about the incentive structure, right? It, if the incentive structure is not there, dealers step away. And your point is maybe the buy side steps in. And maybe that liquidity pool or balance sheet is bigger than what's there for dealers, if I understand the, 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 the context of the observation. Again, if we're talking about resilience, on a normal day, perhaps you're right. You know, maybe the entire buy side balance sheet or ability to transfer risk might be more than the dealer community. In times when you have an auction, or the market's moved a lot, or everyone's going one side, what if there's a redemption? I mean, I won't ask our, my buy side colleague right here, but if you have cash needs, as on the buy side, your mandate is not to provide a price or to be there. And we've seen outflows tend to happen across funds at the same time. What happens then? So I still struggle with resilience. We have had a bifurcated liquidity in the treasury market, I would argue, since 2014, 13. Um, and does that become even more? Because now the dealers have stepped away. You don't have a player whose mandate is to provide prices, wide bid ask, but provide prices. And if that's, they're gone, I think you get much bigger price moves in stress times, in the less liquid products. So I think you should, I think of your question in, on aggregate in normal times and then in stress times. Right. So I would probably look at it from a slightly different angle. I think that's what has happened, right? It's not like, right. so we're, we're worried about something that may happen that we saw from March of 2020 did happen. Um, during that time period, dealer's balance sheet were so constrained, the answer was, I will not put a price on a bond. So we're in a situation we know that is where the risk is, and the Fed has done a great job with repo facilities to allow at least banks to stem the tide a bit. Um, and you know, the market does think is the Fed is the you know the 
dealer of last resort, essentially. So how do we work to improve that? Because that's the like structure we are in right now, right? I, I think to think that we're not in that structure, I think we're, we're kidding ourselves. Now, March of 2020 would have happened and we would have had these issues no matter what. It's just the severity of the move. So when we look at it, whatever can bring, you know, access to backstop facilities such as repo, and I think repo is a very important part in the treasury market, which is different than the corporate credit market, et cetera, because of the huge notional leverage. You know, more access to those type of facilities and backstops to prevent the system from deleveraging in a stressed environment very quickly will all help with treasury market liquidity. Um, but, you know, the, the environment we are in right now is the environment that Priya describes. When a stressed example happens, when there is cash needs, the dealer community, because of their balance sheet constraints from the financial crisis, will step away. And they have stepped away in the last few crises. But if they step away more, it could have been much worse. <laughs> yes, we all know the counterfactual, but I am just highlighting. Well, I think that debate is a, a good point to end the conversation. I want to thank you for the great uh, discussion and, and wide variety of views. So please thank our panelists. Thank you to Nate and all the panelists for that uh, lively discussion. Uh, we have our next speaker at this point in time. Hi. Okay. It's now my pleasure to welcome our next speaker of the day, SEC Chair Gary Gensler. Eric Gensler is the chair of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. If everyone could please um, be quiet. Uh, and he'll be delivering keynote remarks at this time. Chair Gensler was sworn into the office of the chair as chair of the SEC in April 2021. Prior to joining the SEC, he's held a variety of roles at MIT, including as professor of the practice of global economics and, man global economics and management at MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, as well as co-director of MIT's FinTech Initiative and Digital Currency Initiative. He also served as chair of the Maryland Con Financial Consumer Protection Commission. Previously, he was chair of the CFTC, uh, leading the Obama administration's reform of the $400 trillion uh, swaps market. In addition, uh, he also served as uh, the Undersecretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance and Assistant Secretary of the Treasury earlier in his career. Uh, we'll reserve some time at the end of his remarks for audience Q&A. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chair Gensler. Um, thank you so much. It's good to be here. I think this is your eighth annual Treasury Market Conference, and I thank the conference organizers and my colleagues across the uh, interagency working group. As is customary, I'd like to note that I'm only speaking on my own behalf, not for my fellow commissioners and the SEC staff. So let me go back to March of 1998, just for a moment. And that was when I was Assistant Secretary in the Department of Treasury. And I gave my very first speech in public service. I had been at Goldman Sachs for 18 years. Get to the US Department of Treasury. What's that first speech about? You've got it, the Treasury market. My, little, my first speech nearly 25 years ago. I was fortunate to work with an excellent group of colleagues at the U.S. Department of Treasury, including a career public servant, Dave Monroe. For those of you who don't know Dave, he retired, I think, three or four years ago, but he was then the director of cash and debt management at the U.S. Department of Treasury. And every day, Dave wore a different Beatles tie. Every single day, another Beatles tie. Now, if I may say, we had a whole few hard days night, sorry about this, you'll get a theme here, but we had a few hard days nights working on the speech, but with a little help from our friends, we described the Treasury's three principal goals regarding debt management. Sound cash management, lowest cost financing for the taxpayers, and efficient capital markets. That was 25 years ago. When you maximize the competitiveness, the liquidity and resiliency of the $24 trillion treasury market, that does lower the cost of financing and help the American taxpayer, who's ultimately 
the Treasury is issuing for. It also helps the central bank, our Federal Reserve, administer monetary policy. It also helps the fluid functioning of our financial system as treasuries are the base, the foundation of our entire capital markets. Now, of course, lots has changed in the treasury market in those 25 years. Uh, when I was younger, so much younger than today. Sorry about the Beatles themes, guys. But now a significant portion of this market is transacted and intermediated outside of commercial banks. I heard the last panel, it had got into this a little bit, by principal trading firms, by hedge funds and levered funds, and it's traded electronically on the platforms. Nevertheless, I think those three principles that were described back in 1998, that Dave Monroe and others helped me on, um, remain every bit as important. We've also seen a lot of jitters in the market the 2014, the 2019, the 2020 uh, events that are discussed at the last eight years of this conference. And that's why early in this administration, the Treasury Department under Secretary Yellen, the Federal Reserve under Chair Powell, the, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, John Williams leadership and so forth, and the SEC have sort of banded together and have been working together on a series of projects to enhance the competitiveness and resiliency of the treasury market. And to enhance that competition, the official sector is using the tools that you'd hope we'd use, promoting transparency, promoting access to the markets and a fair playing field. To enhance resiliency, we also address system-wide risk by closing regulatory gaps and promoting greater central clearing and competition also helps to improve resiliency because it broadens out the market. There was an earlier panel, the question, my resting foot would have been to answer yes to the question about whether all to all trading helps in resiliency. But I did see there was a split vote on the panel. Though no one policy could have prevented the dash for cash in 2020, our goal was amongst this group working so closely together and remains to improve the smooth functioning of the market so that when whether we're in good times or stressed times it can carry the weight now today i want to just review five important projects you've heard about them from other speakers as well the first two projects center on intermediaries that provide liquidity or perform exchange-like functions in the market and these focus um, on the tools of fair playing field, greater access, transparency. The second two projects deal with central clearing and customer clearing, and those projects really rely on the tools of access, fair playing field, shock absorbers to close regulatory gaps, lower some of the interconnectedness in our market plumbing. And then finally, the fifth project, which I think you heard from Undersecretary uh, Nelly Leong, I think Nelly went through a bit about the post-trade transparency, so I'll say the least about that. But taken together, these five projects, I believe the projects would promote greater resiliency and yes, greater competition. Greater competition does, I believe, help in resiliency as well, allowing more market participants to interact directly with one another, whether through anonymized auto all trading or otherwise. I had that in my written speech before I heard the panel. So the first project about dealers. The commission proposed rules intended to ensure that the market participants who are in the business of providing liquidity in treasuries or other securities or engaging in other similar activities are appropriately registered with the SEC, become members of a self-regulatory organization, FINRA, and comply with federal securities laws and regulatory obligations. This project actually has its roots way back in the 1980s. Um, a sad song that we could make better. Congress understood because between 1982 and 1985, a dozen government securities firms failed. I was early on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs at the time. I remember a few of them, Lombard Wall and Drysdale and others. Thus, in 1986, Congress enacted the Government Securities Act, which for the first time set up a federal regulatory regime shared, but a federal regulatory regime specific to government securities dealers, brokers, and clearing. Congress addressed the regulatory gaps 
I think it's about time that we make sure that we actually seal those gaps about dealer registration. Registration of government securities brokers and dealers means that market participants must, among other requirements, keep important books and records, meet minimum capital requirements, and report certain data to regulators. Not registering in turn leaves the system more opaque and vulnerable than it should be. And in the recent decades, certain market participants, including the principal trading firms, started participating significantly in the treasury cash market. In general, these firms play an increasingly significant liquidity providing role in overall trading and market activity, a role traditionally performed by entities registered with the commission. Some are registered, but not all. Thus, in March, we propose to further define dealer and government securities dealers so that the principal trading firms and, yes, firms performing dealer-like roles register with the SEC and comply with federal securities law and regulatory obligations. I think this lowers risk and creates a fair playing field by supporting transparency and market integrity. And then further, we did vote unanimously as a commission to repropose an earlier rule, 15B91, to require broker dealers participate in our fixed income markets who do participate in it to register with FINRA. And that would also support some of the transparency that Nelly talked about earlier today. On the platforms, we also have a project out and that's where the commission proposed to require that platforms that provide marketplaces for treasuries to register as broker dealers and comply with regulation alternative trading system. This reflects the incredible electronification of a significant changes of our markets. And the proposal would modernize the rules regarding the definition of exchange. It would subject exchange regulatory frameworks, certain interdealer brokers that, for example, provide requests for quote per co protocols as well. The update would close a regulatory gap. Why is it that so much activity is happening and we're not seeing and having more access and more transparency and resiliency? It would require the platforms with significant volume also to have a fair access rule. And that would prohibit platforms from unreasonably prohibiting or limiting access. And additionally, the proposal would bring treasury platforms with significant volume under what's called regulation systems compliance and integrity, cyber resiliency and the like. Now let me turn to central clearing. Uh, I saw Daryl Duffy on the earlier panel and Daryl had written a number of papers on this before I was in this job, but I wanna thank him and compliment him. Nelly wrote papers on this as well. The commission recently proposed rules that would widen the scope of transactions brought into central clearing the treasury markets. Look, clearing houses help lower risk in a system. They've been doing this in the U.S. at least since the 19th century. And in 1986, Congress said, let's make sure that there's a federal regulatory oversight for clearing in treasuries. They sit in the middle of the market, of course, as you know, buyers to every seller and seller to every buyer. Um, otherwise, the whole clearing pro pro process can be a long and winding road. I think Congress understood the importance of clearing houses when they gave us these authorities in 86. And initially in the 1990s, we saw a significant rise in treasury security clearing, but then it went the other way. By 2017, Garrett giving various changes in the market, only about 13% fully centrally cleared. That was part of it. It was the electronification of the markets. Part of it was the principal trading firms. Part of it was related to the inner dealer brokers, where often the IDBs are bringing in just one side of a trade into the central clearing. If the counterparty is not a member of the clearinghouse, they're not bringing in that other trade into the clearinghouse. So broadly speaking, our proposal would require clearinghouses to ensure that the members bring in all of their repurchase agreement transactions, both legs of the transactions for IDB trades and certain additional transactions. 
Let me just say something on repurchase uh, and the funding instruments underlying our debt markets. They were the center of the jitters in the market in 2019. We all can remember that. But moreover, in the last few years, many hedge funds are receiving the vast majority of their repo financing in the non-centrally cleared bilateral market where haircuts or initial margin requirements are not necessarily applied. Let me say this again. Significant amount of our marketplace right now is being funded, non-centrally cleared bilateral market, without haircuts by our banking system or by other participants in the financial markets. For repo transactions, the scope of our proposal is broader than proposed in the cash market and would cover repo transactions entered into by members of the clearinghouse, including a lot of the registered funds as well. On the cash transaction, the focus is a bit narrower. It's on the interdealer brokers that I mentioned. It's on the clearinghouse members on the one hand and hedge funds, levered accounts, including those that are right now uh, uh, hedge, call themselves hedge funds or registered broker dealers on the other hand. I think this helps address contagion risk that could flow through the market if a hedge fund or leveraged fund is unable to deliver on a transaction. Additionally, we took up some rules about uh, enhancing robust governance and risk management in the clearinghouses. I've also asked staff to work forward going forward on a possible recommendations to the commission with regard to clearinghouse recovery and wind down processes. We're working closely with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation on some of those thoughts. Customer clearing, an issue we've had lots of discussion with market participants on is how to better facilitate customer clearing and treasuries and increase access to the market. We do some of that on the platform side through fair access. We do a lot of that by bringing more into the clearinghouse, but the clearinghouse rules themselves to facilitate customer clearing. So we put together three parts in this. Um, one was with regard to the margin collected, so-called gross margining rather than net margining. And under such rules of the clearinghouse, the members no longer could take their proprietary trades and net it against their customer trades in determining the margin. Um, but also what we've done here to help post greater margin is the second reform would change the broker dealer customer protection rules to allow the customer margin that they collect to be onward posted to the clearinghouses, so-called rehypothecated, similar to what we have in the equity derivative space, actually. And then thirdly, we said we would require the clearinghouses to provide policies and procedures to design to facilitate access to clearing. The other project Nelly talked about, but Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the SEC, FINRA are all working together to see if we can strengthen post-trade transparency in the, in the Treasury market. Right now, the reporting is to the official sector. It's technically to FINRA and then FINRA to the official sector. But how can we put more of that information out to the public? In September, the Federal Reserve implemented new rules about banks reporting to Trace. If we were to adopt earlier rules about the dealer community and the so-called 15B91, then more members would be members of FINRA or more dealers would be members of FINRA, more information in that. And then the Treasury, of course, put out a request for comment uh, in this regard. Uh, I think that greater transparency, which we have in the corporate bond market, we have in the municipal market to have the public transparency would enhance that post-trade transparency. So in sum, before I take questions, in the nearly 25 years after my first speech of the Treasury market, I still believe those three principles uh, that discussed back in that time, sound cash management, lowest cost to the taxpayer, efficient capital markets are as true today as they were then. Just the market's grown so significantly, it's now uh, roughly 100% of our GDP, and when I gave that speech, it was 30 to 35% of GDP. I was privileged to continue to partner with my colleagues 
throughout the government this time around, uh, as I say, uh, that I still need them when I'm 64. Now, I did just turn 65, and, and you're probably tired of my Beatles quotes, but I opened the speech by just saying that Dave Monroe's love of the Beatles um, was one of the things that was inspiring me 25 years ago, who wore these Beatles ties. But the other thing about the Beatles that I want to mention is it's one of the United Kingdom's greatest cultural exports. I mean, we all, even today, uh, and admire this incredible band. Well, but that reminds me across uh, the government, we had embarked on these efforts long before the recent hiccups in the UK bond market, in the gilt market. And though I'm glad that Beatlemania came to our shores six de decades ago, I really don't think we want to import the types of market jitters in the gilt market to this market. But I do think what we saw in the gilt markets is a reminder, even a sovereign debt market can have some uh, challenges of resiliency, competitiveness, and depth. The treasury market, the US treasury market is larger than the gilt market. It's arranged very differently. We don't quite have the same uh, challenges that they had around the uh, liability-driven uh, investments, the LDI, so to speak. Uh, so the facts of that situation are rather specific to the United Kingdom, but I think there's really a lesson there that tremors in that market speak to the importance of building resiliency and competitiveness in the U.S. sovereign debt market. Um, so fortunately, those troubles in the gilt market still seem so far away, but let's do what we can to keep it that way. I thank you. Glad to take questions, and thank you for putting up with my little Beatles stories. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience. We'll try to manage this technologically. Okay. Uh, yes. You, you'll just wait for a mic and make sure to introduce yourself when um, you're asking your question. Right there. Hi, Chair Gensler, Paul Hutchin, BNP. Thanks so much for doing this. It sounds like you're saying life goes on, but I'm just kind of curious if you could talk about um, the cost of clearing and not just through the lens of liquidity, transparency, and resiliency, because it seems like those have been the three pillars, to borrow the expression, that we've been focused on so far, but we haven't really spoken about it from a cost perspective. So can you please explain or share with how you're thinking about it from, from your seat? Thank you very much. So I think you look, there are trade-offs and there are costs. I think of central clearing the following. It, it is it's one of those innovations in finance, which again, came along, well over 100 years ago, that nets down through the arithmetic of, of netting down, uh, it actually uh, can lower the risk in a system. You've got to have proper risk management at the clearinghouse, robust risk management. What we have right now is we have a multi-nodal system. Uh, the IDBs not bringing in both legs of their trades are operating almost like mini clearing houses without the robust clearing protections around it, literally. And um, look, whatever happens in a tough marketplace, we do have the central bank, but I'd like to lower that left tail risk that they're not there trying to bail out IDBs in the middle of a stress period of time. And so, Yes, there are cost trade-offs. We review those in our cost-benefit analysis, our economic analysis, and our proposal. And please comment on it. We, we, need the, we need everybody's input. We're going to take that input. We're going to review it with the U.S. Department of Treasury and the Federal Reserve and see where we come out uh, in trying to build greater resiliency. But the trade-off is greater resiliency and also you take a step towards promoting greater competition because buy side firms, principal trading firms, hedge funds would have lower counterparty risk on the other side. And you wouldn't be as reliant, I believe, in the middle of a stress time on just those with the biggest uh, you know, balance sheets. Thank you, Chair Gensler. I don't have any Beatles quote for this question, but I'll ask you the question. 
if we're moving to a world with more central clearing and the, there is pro-cyclicality of margins, we know that in a stress environment, and the margins that the CCP accepts, the, the, the types of collateral, is very different from what the bilateral world accepts. Do you worry at all that there could be a collateral transformation you know, issue? Because I think about the, you, you brought up the, the, the UK LDI issue, which was a margin problem. They had certain assets which they were not able to transform quickly enough. Is this where the central bank has to step in, which the Bank of England tried to do? Or is that something the official sector should think about, either collateral transformation or we just need more collateral that the CCP will take if the world is moving towards more central clearing of every product? Um, I think, again, I, I hear your point in three, three points. Collateral transformation may be that what collateral you can post and what's money good collateral at the clearinghouse. And uh, again, there's some trade-offs there. But I think net-net, you end up with lower amounts of margin necessary with one point that I've tried to make in my prepared remarks. We currently have in the repo market, I'm moving away from cash, but in the repo market, you have a significant portion of the market right now not collecting any margin. That's not the safest system. When you have a bunch of large intermediaries that are providing prime brokerage relationships to significant parts of our sovereign debt market, whether it's to hedge funds, you know, the, the, the macro hedge funds and the like, um, uh, flat or zero haircuts. You get in a stress time, those banks have to change those relationships as well and change those prime brokerage relationships as well. I'd prefer to be in a system where you're actually netting, getting the benefits of netting, but also collecting margin through normal times and stress times. Any other questions? We have one up there on the left. I'd like to ask a question uh, on the regulatory framework. Um, to facilitate all-to-all -all trading, and potentially increase price transparency, do you think that it would require something similar to Reagan MS, where you have a creation of consolidated tape, you have all the protection rules and things like that, uh, adapted for the debt market? Look, I don't know what, you know, in essence, Nellie's and my successors will come to five and 10 years from now. I think, I think what we're trying to piece together here is some greater transparency post-trade and Treasury and FINRA are taking the lead on that, but I support those efforts. I think that getting the platforms to have fair access, and you know, there's uh, a handful of key IDBs and, and uh, RFQ platforms that were talked about in the earlier panel. I think getting them not just registered, but, but also uh, importantly, fair access is a really important feature of it. You're asking the national market system and equities that was cobbled together in the 1970s uh, was really about uh, pre-market and sharing that pre-market transparency across the market. It's not part of the current project, but I, I, I think that getting the central clearing, getting the platforms registered, ensuring that the principal trading firms and the high, higher leveraged uh, uh, players in the market are registered is going to facilitate uh, a much more competitive, more resilient market, and it may well be that there would be projects in the future, but it's not in, in, it's not, I don't think it's necessary to see the benefits of these projects. I think these projects can stand on their own, or on their own uh, before consideration of what you're talking about would be taken up, whether that's in a uh, for future uh, officials. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Sure. USC. Is this on? Can you hear me? Chairman Gensler, it's Larry yes. Harris from USC. Um, there is a 
significant and very obvious difference between the uh, corporate credit markets and the treasury markets. In the treasury markets, the primary market is extraordinarily important. The government's there all the time. And the Federal Reserve is in the secondary markets as well, uh, pretty much all the time. And so the question is, how do the government's needs for uh, being in these markets uh, affect uh, the market microstructure that would be best for our economy? I think it, to me, it highlights the importance of uh, getting more players in the market and getting a deeper market. And, and I, I, I think that the, the Treasury is the issuer and the Federal Reserve using it as monetary, a, a means, a tool in monetary policy just highlights the importance to try to get the micro market structure enhanced. Um, and then, then you might say, all right, so which, which pieces of it? Central clearing to me is a really important piece. I, I just, uh, I look at this market, this multi-nodal market with the hubs, multiple hubs that are not really inside of a good clearinghouse structure, the, the nodes being these IDBs and the like, um, tr clearing one side and not another side of their trade. The funding market, the repo market that has such a significant portion right now where macro and other uh, hedge funds are getting zero or flat margin in the system um, uh, right now. And also that we can enhance some of the transparency. And I would have raised my hand. I know Priya wouldn't have raised it, but I, was ra I would have raised it with Daryl and some others uh, on that panel that I think all to all trading actually enhances competition enhances resiliency, and on the margin, just a wee bit, could lower the cost to the taxpayers. Great. And I think that also, if I could say, could facilitate what the Federal Reserve does is using treasuries as a tool to effectuate monetary policy. But that's why we're, we're, we're locked together. I mean, we're, we're doing this with Secretary Yellen's team and Chair Powell's teams, and, and um, I see Nellie in the front row there, but... Um, this is a whole team effort. Great. Thank you again to Chair Gensler. Uh, we will be taking a brief break now for a uh, coffee break outside, and we'll reconvene at 3 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, at this time, we're going to, uh, if everybody could take their seats, we're going to jump right into panel number three here. Um, this panel is going to discuss the appropriate roles for the official sector versus the private sector in uh, resiliency of liquidity in the Treasury market. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to hand the discussion over to Don Cohn, who will be moderating the panel. Uh, Donald Cohn holds the Robert V. Rusa Chair in International Economics and is the Senior Fellow in Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution. He is a 40-year uh, veteran of the Federal Reserve System, serving as a member and then Vice Chair of the Board of Governors from 2002 uh, to 2010, and has also served as an external member of the Financial uh, Policy Committee at the Bank of England. Um, pass it to you, Don. And uh, great to be back at the New York Fed. Spent many hours here in my 40 years at the, at the board, so great to be here. Um, let me introduce our panel. So, uh, and we'll go in alphabetical order, both the introductions and then the, uh, then the uh, interventions. Beth Hammock is the co-head of Global Financing Group at Goldman. She's also still the chair of the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, so very involved in these kinds of things. Andrew Metrick is the Janet Yellen Professor of Finance uh, and uh, Management at Yale, so I didn't realize that until I read the... So to be the Janet Yellen Professor, I think you need to be really smart, really nice, really prepared, 
and you're all those things, I know that. What you can't do is pop your collar, I can see no. that, so <laughs> you'll fail, you fail that one. <laughs> Jeremy Stein is the Moses Safra uh, Professor of Economics at Harvard. So uh, let's, the, this is, conferences has been about treasury market resilience, the first principle that the IAWG enunciated that should guide public policy is promoting resilient and elastic liquidity. We've already had two panels on changes in the market structure and that might or might not uh, promote this resiliency. I think the fact that we were talking about in normal times and stress times, so I think the emphasis is on stress times, the resiliency in stress times. Um, so this panel should expand on what the public and private sectors can do to help increase the provision market liquidity by the private sector. What should a, and in the event that uh, that's not adequate, what should a public sector central bank backstop look like when despite the reforms and changes, private sector provision liquidity can't prevent systemically harmful uh, market dysfunction. Jerry Pucci said this morning, looking at John Williams at the time, I think he said, when the stress hits, everyone looks at the central bank. Uh, so I think we're going to try and talk a little bit today, uh, this afternoon, about what the central bank might be doing and pros and cons of various approaches to that. So let me start with the private sector, Beth. Um, so, is private sector intermediation capacity adequate? And if not, what can be done about it? Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm, it's my pleasure to be in this group. And while I don't have your regulatory or, or either of your academic credentials, hopefully, hopefully my perspective as a market participant trading these securities over the past nearly 30 years and as a bank treasurer for a G GSIB um, helps inform some of the, the conversation around this. Um, I think we're here because, as we all know, the Treasury markets feel particularly volatile right now, and liquidity feels thin. And while you can go back and look at different periods in time and see kind of what, what's normal, what's not normal, I think the fact that we are coming out of a period of 10 to 15 years of unprecedented central bank accommodation um, and balance sheet size means that the past 10 to 15 years are probably the anomaly and not what we should expect. And so I go back to the early parts of my career um, in the late 1900s or the early 2000s, um, <laughs> when when uh, you know when markets moved a fair amount, and so if you look at what we've seen this year, and this year I think is somewhat of an exception, just given the rapid change uh, in the monetary policy framework um, and the overall environment. But this year we've had 51 days where treasuries have moved more than 10 basis points. Mm -hmm. In 2018 it was zero. Now, I don't think zero is right, I don't think 51 is right, but I think you can go back to something like a 94, a 2004, something like that, 99, and find something in a more normal cadence where you'll see those types of moves. Um, but obviously, as you're seeing these types of very significant moves, what you're finding is that the liquidity doesn't, doesn't feel great. And I do think that on a volatility-adjusted basis, it looks better, but it still doesn't feel particularly great, even when you look at it on a vol-adjusted basis. Um, and so I think the question is, you know, what is, what should be the norm? What should be the rule set as we go forward? As we've talked about a lot um, this morning already, we're at a place right now where the treasuries outstanding are much, much larger than they were when the rule set was put in place. So if you go back to the rule set coming out of the, of the crisis, and I think Jeremy at the time you were on the Board of Governors um, when these rules were put in place, there was discussion when the leverage rules were put forward that if the treasury market grew from what at the time was around an $8 trillion, maybe a $10 trillion market, um, you might need to relax some of those constraints to allow for you know, banks in, to become intermediaries. So not only have we, have we you know, tripled since 2010, we've actually grown about 40% in marketable debt in the past three years, so just since the beginning of the pandemic. And so it's really accelerated rapidly, and you are starting to feel that strain quite acutely on balance sheets. The other piece that I'll point to is the GSIB scores. So these GSIB buffers, the globally systemic important uh, buffers that are put in place, those were calibrated in 2012. There was discussion that those would be revisited in three years. Those have not changed. And so you can imagine when you're actually hearkening a complexity and a size score to something from 
10 years ago with the debt having grown as much as it has grown, the overall GDP having grown as much as it's grown, those are becoming more and more constraining. And so what you're finding is that the banks who had been the stabilizers in the past and were well equipped to do that are not able to be the stabilizers right now. And so we need to look to other places to find that. And so when you have these very large moves, the question is who do you want it to be? It's probably not gonna be able to be the banks given the current regulatory rule set. You could make amendments to that rule set and provide them more ca capabilities of doing it. Or does a central bank need to step in? Or can some of these other things we've talked about, like all to all trading, clearing, transparency, can those help to mitigate um, some of these? So let me, let me go through some of these um, in that vein. The first is on transparency. I think the, um, you know, the RFI that was put forward, I think brought out a lot of good feedback and a lot of good information around the treasury market, the different segments of the treasury market, and where you could see benefits or possible risks to increasing transparency. I think when you go through and look at the studies from other markets, what you show is that increased transparency gives you this trade-off of tighter bid-ask spreads, but at a cost of typically smaller trade sizes, lower overall volumes, and much more difficulty in risk transfer trades. It's just a trade-off, and so you can choose to be in either of those places. When you think about the different segments of the market, on the runs, obviously very liquid, and I think most people would say quite transparent in terms of their pricing, both pre and post at this point, but other segments like off the runs, tips, strips, bills, much less so in terms of the transparency, and so those become more difficult to move. So it's hard to see significant benefits for the transparency in the on the runs in immediate dissemination, but it's also hard to see that there's a real risk to doing that. And so I think this opportunity and the, the announcement um, that, that Nelly made this morning is helpful in terms of taking steps forward and being able to run real cases to understand what the changes are that we see and going very, very slowly um, to make sure that you know, you're not breaking anything that's such an important market um, for us. I do think having more transparency in on the runs will bring in some new, new participants. Um, if you did it in off the runs, you'd probably bring in even more new, trans new participants. It's worth thinking about not while I, while I think it is always better to have more participants in a marketplace, not all participants are created equal and not all of them behave equally in moments of stress. And so by bringing in more entrants, you might be increasing optical liquidity and size of order book at a particular point in time, but it may be that it's res re less resilient because in stress, some of those participants pull away faster. And so that's just a consideration to think about. Um, I won't say a lot about clearing because I think we've done that in pretty, pretty great detail. Um, but I do think you know, the big benefit of cash clearing is facilitating all to all trading. The last panel went through in great detail about the pros and cons of all to all trading. Um, for repo trading, I think there are slightly larger benefits because it, it is a credit intermediation is where I think um, clearing has the biggest benefit. Um, there may be some benefits from a netting perspective, but I think the benefits from a capital perspective for the banks are actually gonna be somewhat limited. And so while it will help on the leverage issues, I don't think it will help on the risk-based capital issues that are coming forward. The last thing, which I was surprised no one raised in the panel, so I'll just mention it here, is that while you do need to have a very well-governed, risk-managed CCP, you do increase the pro-cyclicality of the market when you concentrate all that risk. And we saw that very clearly with the GameStop issues from, um, from just a short while ago. Um, the other thing I would just note is that the structure of DTCC and its clearing is quite different from the structure of clearing organizations like the CME um, or LCH in that there is a mutualized default fund which creates other issues that could be um, you know, systemic issues that would come. So the last one is, I'll go in a little bit more detail on the reg changes. Uh, again, there are no silver bullets. There's just a series of trade-offs. And this rule set that kept us so safe through 2020 and I think really has made the banking system overall um, much more robust in this period did, did present some constraints in terms of the flexibility. Um, the rule set is complex. There are many different rules to which an institution needs to comply at the same period of time. And so any rapid shifts that happen in the market take a while for banks to incorporate. So you saw this in 2020, you saw this in 2019 with the repo eruptions. Um, in that there were great opportunities, but it just takes a long time in inside an organization to actually make some big changes when you're near your binding constraints. Um, so when we think about this, again, I think you have to look at both, we talk a lot about the leverage constraints, and so we should talk about those, but the risk-based constraints are real and important in this context as well. And so when you think about most of the banks right now, 
the large banks are actually bound by their risk base, their standardized risk capital rules. Um, at the IDI, the, um, the bank level, within those organizations, they're actually bound more by leverage, just given that there's a higher minimum on the SLR at the bank level. But you have to look at the bindingness across both of these when you're making any determination to think about where you want to be. And so given, given the complexity of this, you need to look at both those leverage rules as we talked about and, and, and the risk-based rules. The risk-based rules, the one that's increased the most, as I mentioned, is the GSIB. So in this new stress capital buffer framework, um, while I geek out on regulatory rules for two seconds, um, you have both this stress test, but then you also have this add-on buffer based on your size, scale, and complexity. And while I think, it, again, it is helpful, the fact that we've grown so significantly and the fact that governments around the globe took such significant actions to combat the COVID-19 pandemic means that those buckets, those sizes from 2012 are really out of date. And so you're seeing every bank really become capital constrained. Isaac talked about it earlier because they, they're trying to manage around these issues and because these are, are quite significant. Now, one of the problems with the GSIB score is it does touch on treasuries in a number of different ways. And so it's incorporated in the size indicator, which takes total leverage exposure coming from your SLR. It takes, there's an interconnectedness score that looks at your secured, um, your short-term wholesale funding transactions. That's in there, whether it's with treasuries or other instruments. Um, you also look at a complexity score. And so if you're doing a repo with international counterparts, that adds to your complexity score. So there are multiple places where this gets tagged, and so that, that activity in treasuries actually gets penalized more than, than you would think. Um, and so I, I guess what I would say is that, you know, these are, again, a series of choices. It's all about the calibration and where you want to be on the risk spectrum. With the rule set the way it is now, it does not surprise me that we've needed central banks to come in and become that lender of last resort. I personally would be much happier if we had private market solutions and the private market could function more independently. Um, but I do think when you, when you look at some of these big market stresses like 2020, there are times when the market is really all going largely in one direction. And there is an important role, I think, for someone to play. Maybe it's a dealer, maybe it's some other, other counterparty to warehouse risk and put a risk transfer price on a trade. But then you need to have the ability to be flexible and dynamic in your balance sheet. So I will, I will leave it there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Beth. I, I think you really put an important point on the table, which is that GSIB uh, measurement. There's been a lot of emphasis on the SLR and relieving the pressure from that, given the size of the Fed's balance sheet, for example. But the GSIB has some, not ri some pieces, as you pointed out, that aren't really risk sensitive, and that can also and does also constrain Things. So I guess one question would be, if you were the regulator and you wanted to give relief on GSIB and SLR, are there things the regulator can do to make sure that doesn't really release a bunch of capital, that the banks are um, just as resilient after, or the bank holding companies just as resilient after as they are uh, before you lowered those things? Well, I think the question is, at what level are we supposed to be resilient? So we've built up increased capital requirements at all the banks over the past several years. Are we supposed to go back and look at that calibration? The magical 2012 calibration, was that perfect? Is it more appropriate now than it was then? But I think going back and just looking at that and resetting and re-underwriting, is that the right level? Where do we want it to be? I think you could rebucket things and do it in a way where um, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna significantly alter the aggregate capital needs, or you might bring it back to a place where it's slightly reduced, but not dramatically reduced, because if what you really want to do is create more intermediation capacity at the banks, they might need to have lower capital requirements, or, or capital requirements based on different factors, right? Maybe it's not coming from some of these things that are driving the GSIB score, but maybe you want it more in the risk-based, um, like an advanced approach type metric to look at. Thank you. So, Andrew, if if we don't get the action that we need on GSIBs and SLR, and even I guess if we do, there could be need for a central bank backstop, um, how, would you, how should the central bank or the treasury think about how it backstops this market in stress? Thank you, thank you. And um, let me say, this is a safe space for geeking out over regulatory rules. I think that's sort of a very important part of the conversation. Uh, I'm gonna emphasize that too. Um, so 
One thing I just want to point out, and most people in the room know it, but there's a few young people here maybe who don't remember, which is September 2019 and March 2020, we know we, people wanted cash and they had treasuries and they wanted to get cash for those treasuries. Uh, in 2008, there was a huge excess demand for treasuries, right? And the, the, the TSLF program was enormously successful in part because of that. Great. People preferred to get those treasuries than to go and get cash in a lot of cases. And so we do need to make sure that if we're worried about what's happening to the market in extremists, that we do care about both sides of these things, that we, that we have something set up for both sides. Luckily, we do, right? We now have set up both a kind of standing reverse repo facility and a standing repo facility. Um, they're operating in strange ways as peacetime and wartime animals. Uh, the reverse repo facility is really big. Uh, it has some purposes that are beyond just uh, uh, emergency purposes. But it does seem like what we want to, what I would like to think a lot about, I think these things are here. It's wonderful that we've designed them. We did not have a standing repo facility ready and able to handle the problems of September 2019 and March 2020. So we haven't really stress tested these things. The reverse repo facility hasn't had a stress event for its side of the market. And uh, the, 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 um, the repo facility wasn't set up until after those stress events. Um, so I think what we, what we really need to be doing is thinking about how they will operate in extremists. And this is where we have to geek out about the regulatory rules. So it's not just a matter of the Federal Reserve, and I'll come back in a minute to why I think it should continue to be the Federal Reserve, but why the Federal Reserve needs to be standing there in an emergency. We all understand that it has to be, that there's no one else who, who is going to be there in an emergency. But they're usually, they need the banks or whoever else is a legal counterparty in these programs to be willing to come to them. So uh, that means they have to be not stigmatized. And the way they're set up now is really a great design for that on some level because of the auction mechanism. But they also need to not be bumping up against weird kinds of constraints. So it can't be the case that, that both regulators and supervisors have to kind of see them this way. The regulators in, in seeing that it can't be the case that a GSIB is afraid to play its role in going from one of these things to another because it's going to have some weird effect uh, on some regulatory ratio. And the supervisors need to play nice and not yell at institutions for using what is supposed to be an emergency uh, authority. I mean, we, we, we kind of did that to our discount window 100 years ago, and we still haven't recovered. Uh, so let, I, I don't want to do it to, to, to this piece either. In terms of the, the role here and why I think that it does need to be the Fed is that um, we've heard, we heard from Gary, we heard from, from other people, the role, the Treasury's job is to kind of fund the government in the cheapest, most sustainable way, and they should keep doing that job. And the Fed's job has long been, here is the quantum of government debt that is out there. We're going to play around with the term structure of that. Right? Traditional open market operations were of that form, where we exchange reserves for short-term treasuries. Um, we have, through uh, QE and its reverse, started playing other types of games with a longer part of the curve quite explicitly. And in general, in these cases where you're saying, come and take reserves, which are the very, very shortest form of government debt that you can have, and exchange them for some form of government paper, there is a duration risk and an interest rate risk there. But there's no you know, risk risk, default risk that's any different between these things. And so just as I think the government should be willing to exchange dollar bills for quarters, kind of sort of on demand, certainly in extremists, they should be willing to do this as well. It's just a matter of getting the pricing right. And the way we're currently doing the pricing, we have kind of have like a monster RRP uh, that's out there. Um, maybe that's not quite right. Uh, you know, maybe that's not where we want to be in equilibrium. In equilibrium, we want to have something that's there that has regular auctions, but perhaps isn't the place where everyone wants to park their money during peacetime. Um, so that during wartime, we can kind of ratchet these things up and make sure they're not bumping into any of the rules. So that's, that, 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 that's what I think. <laughs>
All right, thank you. Do you have other thoughts, Jeremy, on this uh, government backstop or yeah, Fed backstop? Yeah, I thought I would, if I might say a, a couple words both about the leverage ratio stuff and about the, uh, and about the repo. repo. Uh, I will say something about the leverage in part because it's a, 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 an issue of some psychic pain for me. Um, as Beth said, I was at the Fed when we did this and uh, you know, I have uh, no small measure of guilt. Um, uh, I agree, it's not a panacea, you know, dialing back the leverage ratio, not a panacea helpful, you could do a similar thing, an analogous thing with GSIB, uh, totally agree. Um, you know, the benefits may not be huge, but I don't really see what the costs are. I'll come back to kind of capital level in a second. I don't see what the costs are. In fact, I think the costs are negative because it doesn't just distort the treasury market, it distorts a bunch of other stuff. So there's some nice recent research out of Wharton showing essentially that when the leverage ratio is binding and the Fed expands reserves, banks also crowd out their lending. So it's problematic in a bunch of ways. Um, and of course, you can be as much of a capital hawk as you'd like, you just don't want it, you know, it's like the difference between how much tax revenue do I want to raise and what do I want the marginal tax rate on different things to be. Um, so, you know, we could um, dial back the leverage ratio, we could change the way the GSIB surcharges are done while making a compensating adjustment in the risk base to ensure that there's at least as much, if not more capital um, in the system. And I would recommend that that would be the way uh, uh, we, do, we do it. Um, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, repo facility, um, I agree with Andrew. I mean, I think it was a good thing for the Fed to create the standing repo facility. It's very good for it to be a standing facility. I think they missed an opportunity by not making it be more broad-based. So in its current incarnation, it's restricted to banks and to, to dealer firms. So to see why it might be better if it was broader access, think about March 2020. We know there was a ton of selling in the Treasury market. We know that a bunch of it came from, say, hedge funds and mutual funds who needed to get cash or who thought they were going to need to get cash. Now, if they knew for sure that they could come to the Fed whenever, they might have held fire a little bit and not sold. But if you don't have that assurance and the Treasury market is kind of going crazy, you better sell now before things get worse so you can get your hands on the cash. So I think it's important to have, or at least there are scenarios in which the broad access helps. You know, you might say, well, what if the Fed lends to, you know, the banks, the broker dealers, won't they on lend? Well, no, then we run into the same balance sheet constraints. If they on lend, either they blow up their leverage ratio or, you know, in a moment of stress, they may just for whatever internal risk management reasons also not want to blow up their balance sheets. So I think there's at least a scenario where being able to tap directly um, and, you know, and think about what happened in the UK if, the, if these LDI firms um, were able to directly access um, lending, the, the Bank of England might not have been put in a position to have to buy, to buy bonds. Now, as against that, and I suspect some of the reluctance on the part of the Fed, is sort of a bunch of objections that go under the broad umbrella of moral hazard. You know, these are unregulated guys, and it just doesn't, you know, and I, you, you know it's sort of in the DNA of Fed staff to not want to have one of their facilities be, be available to these unregulated guys. A couple of things to say. First of all, these are treasuries, okay? They're lending against treasury collateral, uh, so that's like pretty good collateral. Second, it's very important, there's a huge distinction here between lending against treasuries, lending against corporate bonds. What if the terrible thing happens and people, you know, uh, a hedge fund that was doing a treasury futures tr basis trade does it more aggressively because of this? Well, I guess the spread goes away, the hedge fund makes less money, and in the meantime, treasury prices go up, yields go down, good for the taxpayer. In other words, you're basically saying, yeah, we're creating a liquidity put on treasuries that should be internalized to the benefit of the taxpayer, right? I mean, that, that feels like a good thing. It's not really costing uh, the system, the sort of government system anything. Obviously, if you put a put on corporate bonds, there'd be a problem because you wouldn't be recovering. Um, if you don't like those two arguments, let's stipulate that there's still some residual moral hazard here, but I think you gotta ask yourself the relative moral hazard question, which is if you don't do this, there's a tail scenario in which instead you're cornered into buying the bonds. And I think whatever your views on moral hazard, it's gotta be more moral hazardy to in an adverse situation, basically take a bunch of duration off the table as opposed to just lending on a collateralized basis. Not to mention in this environment, it's pretty confusing like with your monetary policy, right? As we saw, in, so you know, we've got inflation, we have a little bit of a break in the market and all of a sudden we're gonna start doing QE. So, 
Again, not a panacea, but if it, if it sort of lowers the probability of you having to go to a more extreme intervention, I think that's, uh, that's helpful um, as well. So let me, let me stop there. Thanks, Jeremy. I would say my pet adjustment to the risk-based capital to compensate for any cap is a counter-cyclical capital buffer and more active use. And that's my experience at the Bank of England. We used it very actively, and I think it was helpful in being able to release the capital buffer on times of stress to encourage lending, provided that the banks were safe enough that you could release it and they were still safe. On the stigma issue, so Beth, has Goldman Sachs ever used the standing repo facility? <laughs> I'm not sure I, I, can, I can comment on that publicly. We, I mean, we would, as, a ma as a matter of course, we would use it to test it. We try to test our access to all okay. these facilities, yeah. but I don't think we've had occasion to need to use it in material size. I will say the biggest problem with accessing the standing repo facility is that to get real benefit from it, you would need to be able to build that into your liquidity stress tests and to allow to be, used, to be able to use it in the liquidity stress test. I don't know that we've had a moment since it's been live that we would have needed yeah. to use it, but. It's both the regulatory and supervisory issue, but it's also a public issue. To your point about the discount window, there's press articles out there, and there's just general concern when banks are taking advantage of these facilities. They get spun the wrong way, and so even if you had the regulators and supervisors playing nice, I, I, don't, I think it would take a long way to get companies comfortable accessing these facilities, which, by the way, you don't really want them to, but if you allowed us to build that into our liquidity planning, then you would, go, you would send a very strong signal that it was something we were meant to do in times of stress. Can I, can I not, uh, yeah, can not I, only liquidity stress tests, but the recovery and resolution yeah, absolutely. plans. Absolutely. So I think for Fed out there, you can help reduce the stigma by incorporating this really important backstop into your, into your function without, without into your stress test or allowing the banks to incorporate it. at least you would be sending a signal Jeremy. yeah I, so just related to this obviously is the issue of pricing of the facility so I think many of us have a sort of instinctive budget principle that you know you should be lending at a penalty rate and so it shouldn't be in a facility that you would find it economically attractive to use in normal times but I think that runs the risk of perpetuating the stigma because if you're using it at the penalty rate, boy, you must be like in pretty bad shape. You could imagine, I don't, I don't have a sort of clear view on this, but you know, it's, it's an interesting trade-off at a minimum to think about pricing it. It's kind of what Andrew was saying. We somehow have priced the RRP so that it's super attractive. Um, we've priced or you know, priced and regulated and supervised the, the other facility so it's less attractive. I'm not sure what terrible, I'm, I really don't know what the right answer is, but I'm not sure what terrible damage there would be if unlike other facilities that weren't treasuries, uh, we priced this one so there was some use in normal times, that would sort of lubricate, you know, so it's just a kind of business as usual thing that you would sometimes do, just, you know, sometimes the market is such that you, you go there, obviously when you're in no trouble, maybe that makes it a little bit easier. Again, I think that at least is something that should be game for, for thinking about in the design of something like this. Andrew. So, uh, I would say, you know, Beth's point about being able to use this in liquidity stress tests, for example, that's exactly what we should be thinking about now, right? So the, the, the thing we need to be thinking about, we can't fix what the press stories will be, but we certainly can make it so that we haven't institutionalized a reason that people don't want to use an emergency facility. And you know, on the budget, rule, as has been pointed out by our Nobel Prize winner, Ben Bernanke, uh, when he talked about it at the time, that the Bank of England was a private institution at the time that Badgett was giving that advice. And you know, part of this was they, they should make a profit. Um, and we don't always necessarily follow Badgett when we're actually designing these programs in, in the crisis time itself. But we're doing something quite reverse in the, in the reverse repo facility today. I mean, you, you want something so that it's not being used all the time like crazy and you have this huge footprint um, during peacetime, but does get used. So for that reason, it's got to be designed. It certainly is part of what would happen in a liquidity stress event, in a macro liquidity stress event. Um, and so it should be part of the way we run those tests. Otherwise, we're showing our confusion about what these things are actually meant to do. So Jeremy, in your um, comments, you mentioned 
the potential, the other type of backup would be the Purchase. central bank coming in and purchasing securities as it mm -hmm. did in March of 2020 for market functioning mm -hmm. uh, purposes. So, um, and that's what the Bank of England did. So the Bank of England did purchases first and then they opened a lending facility. So I gather you guys would open the lending facility or make sure it's used first and then do purchases. Do you have any, do any, any of you have thoughts about under what circumstances should the central bank, what should trigger a central bank coming in to actually do purchases? And, and how does the market think about that, that yeah, kind so, of thing? So the thing I'll say about the Bank of England when they announced their purchases is it had kind of the same effect as when the Fed announced the corporate bond purchases, which was it was a big announcement and they didn't end up having to buy very much right. because the announcement in and of itself had the desired impact to let investors know that there would be a price. But the market had moved so dramatically in price terms, you had 100 basis point swings in gilts, um, that when they actually put the pricing on, they had very significant reserve pricing, which meant that you had to really, really want to sell to get out, or you had to really, really need to sell to get out. And so a lot of people chose not to, to take advantage of that. Um, that. That, to me, is kind of a well-designed facility in that you want it to be punitive in that moment of stress, if it's a stress as opposed to the standing repo facility. Yes. And so you set it as this back, this back bid for the market, which is essentially what it's meant to be. Right? You don't want to let the fact that the government set a new budget and the market didn't like it reprice your entire debt stock, which is what happened. Right? And so they, they basically put their reserve pricing in line so that the announcement had the impact, but they didn't really have to support the market with their balance sheet. Do you have any uh, further thoughts? Yeah, I on mean, that? and the other the other sort of difficult design thing, of course, in the U.S., we did end up having the Fed did end up having to buy a massive amount for market function purposes, but it wasn't really made as clear up front where the dividing line was between kind of market function and QE, and it kind of ended up bleeding into QE. Um, that would be a real problem, especially obviously in, a, in an inflationary environment. So right. there needs to be. It's, this is, I think, much trickier because I think, unlike the standing repo facility, I don't think you want to make public any notion that we're there. Uh, there, I, I would prefer to be on the sort of ambiguity side uh, because it really should be a last resort. But I think internally, you really need to think very carefully, how do I design this so it's very clear, as the Bank of England did, mm. helped, I think, a little bit by the fact that it's a separate FPC that does it, right. um, but very clear that it's a market-making activity. Maybe the day you buy, you're clear that you're going to liquidate in X number of months because you're just acting as a market maker, but it's tricky. It's tricky. You don't want to go there. You really sort of want to avoid that, that, that part. So I would separate out two different things, the, the announcement effects that signal what the government's stance is and how much they're going to be there, and then the actual mechanics of the program. The buying and lending difference for governments kind of in extremists is really just a question of where the, who's holding the duration risk, who's holding the interest rate risk kind of at that moment. It's not really about default risk, and it's not even about liquidity if you're willing to lend as much as you would be willing to buy. You can take as much out of the market. And I don't know whether that, in a crisis time, is the first order problem. What you get is the, uh, uh, I have to think a little bit. Uh, it, it, Jeremy has been a, a fan of constructive ambiguity for, for a long time. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm convinced it's, it's always what you want to do here. I think sometimes the thing you want to do is exactly what the Bank of England did, which is some kind of strong signal. I think you can do that with either of those things. You can announce, we're going to auction 4x what we've been auctioning before in, a, in, a, uh, in an RRP uh, setting. Or you can say, we're going to buy that, that amount. Um, and you need a mechanism whereby you can signal whatever it is that you want to signal. Yeah, I'm just, sorry. Just, no, no, no. I, th I think I misspoke. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that you're ambiguous at the point that you launch the program. Right. You don't want the market to know unconditionally see, ex how ante of... that if things go wrong, this is what a Fed buying program is going to look like. It will, that's, I think, a, a, a step a little farther. I wonder whether any of you have uh, reflections. We, we had a lot of discussion in the last panel, and actually the first panel, about the changing structure of the Treasury market and the changing um, makeup of the, 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 the global nature of the market, but also the high-frequency traders, PTFs, and hedge funds coming in. Does that 
How does that affect how the Fed should think about how its backstop? Is there, is there a way, and, and is, there a way of, is there any way of getting those folks to play a bigger role in the provision of liquidity and stress, or we should just assume they're going to go away in stress? I think what you have to look at is the the structure, the capital structure of those institutions, yeah. and and the the nature. And so I think what what the SEC has proposed in terms of wrapping them into a broker, a proper broker dealer framework, will go a long way in terms of making sure that you have a level playing field and that they have to operate with more staying power. But for the most part, these firms don't tend to hold a lot of positions overnight. They tend to be in and out very quickly. They're trying to you know. Um, they're very short-term liquidity providers. They're not looking at big risk transfer trades, and so it's a different role for them. And so in stress, I think it's difficult, it's not impossible, but I think it's difficult for them to play more of that stabilizer role. Because I do think when you go back and look at the markets in 2020, this dash for cash was real. And you could have had people who would have shown up at a price, but everyone's first move was to make sure they had cash. Yeah. And then they would step back and think about, okay, now where am I willing to invest? But I think that all to all that matching is not going to, it's not going to flow. You're going to have these air pockets in that type of an environment. Yeah, so just, just to build on that, I mean, I think this is a pretty important, a very important observation just for the whole day in a sense, that which is, you know, we've talked a lot of, about fixing very, you know, sort of you know, improving various frictions in markets and market microstructure. But even if you abstract at a much higher level, there's a fundamental kind of evolutionary problem, which is because of technology, and this would be true in any market structure. Because of technology, we've got guys who can move in and out very quickly. As a result, they can run with less capital because they can get out pretty quickly and end the day flat. And that has a Darwinian advantage, right? So those guys will gain market share um, because they can run capital efficient. And that's a very good thing on a normal day. Um, and it's just not a very good thing on a two or three standard deviation day. Yeah. And that basic thing applies across kind of any, you know, you can abstract from all the details of market structure. So I think fixing all the things that we've talked about today is helpful, but I think these air pockets have become more frequent precisely because of that sort of evolutionary process, leaving the Fed, unfortunately, uh, with some tail. And of course, we can mitigate, and all the things that we do will mitigate, but I think the, I the idea that we're gonna somehow mitigate to the point um, I just don't think that there's going to be enough capital kind of in any system that's going to be there for the most extreme fat tail kind of, kind of events. Well, we have a few minutes to take uh, questions from the audience. Do we have some questions? Daryl. Thanks. Uh Jeremy, you mentioned uh, this tension that arises where the central bank is trying to conduct monetary policy and it says, oh, time out. <clears throat> uh, at the Bank of England, uh, the bank is indemnified so that there's at least less uh, confusion about the independence of the central bank. Who's, too st who's taking the tab on this cost? Uh, bank of Canada sometimes act as an agent for the government of Canada yes. when it's rescuing the Canada government bond market. So that kind of brings us to the question, why would it necessarily be on the Fed's tab to step in as a buyer of last resort? Could it possibly be an agent or for the Treasury? Or could the Treasury do switch auctions for bills or yep. be responsible for maintaining the, the market without impinging on monetary uh, independence of the central bank. The idea, the idea being that y you know there's no sign that the central bank is somehow bailing out the treasury uh, in extremis and holding down yields. Wh what do you think about that trade-off? Obviously, the central bank is well positioned to operationally to do this better, perhaps. But what it's about a, this trade-off? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not quite sure, it, and it makes complete sense to me. And it's funny. It's like the opposite of what you want when you're doing QE for monetary policy. When you're buying bonds for monetary policy, you want, in, in principle, the Treasury could do a similar you know, maturity swap, but you want it to be the Fed because you like that it's signaling about monetary policy. Here, you're sort of on the other side. You don't want to send any signal about monetary policy, so maybe it's the Treasury. I mean, you could imagine various implementations, like maybe the, 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 the Treasury runs with a big balance at the Fed in the Treasury general account, and so it has like an extra trillion that it can do to 
do this kind of thing. I think that's an interesting, I mean, I don't know enough quite about the sort of institutional issues here, but it seems like a very natural thing to want to think about. I do, I do think there's an element of the, tre the Treasury's job is to raise funds to meet the budget and the appropriations that are set forward. And so to the extent that Treasury, Treasury's not going to be able to create dollars out of thin air, right? Actually, the Fed is the only institution I know that can do that with, with, between reserves and, and others. And so if Treasury were going to be the institution doing it, they would have to issue more debt to facilitate those buybacks. Net-net, when you think about it on a consolidated government balance sheet, I'm not sure it makes a huge difference one way or the other, but from a budgetary perspective and from a funding perspective, for Treasury to step in and look at buybacks um, that were ad hoc or in moments of stress, what you tend to find is there's a positive correlation to Treasury's funding need going up because we're in an environmental stress and Treasury needs to do more funding and more issuance. So for them to be both raising significant amounts of debt and buying back significant amounts of debt, so just looking at 2020, Treasury issued, and I'm looking at Brian, four trillion dollars, give or take, in a very short window, and the Fed bought back a, a not dissimilar amount of debt in that similar, you know, in that in that time period. So, if Treasury had been the buyer of those securities, they would have had no no actual debt raise, right? They wouldn't have had any cash to be able to disperse into the real economy, which is primarily their function. And so, I think whether the Fed is doing it on behalf of Treasury in some way or as their agent. It, I, I think it gets into some of the accounting mechanisms, and I'm by no means an expert in this area that's worth thinking about, but I think Treasury being the buyer in regular times, unless it's a program that's built into their overall regular and predictable funding plans, is going to be very difficult. Andrew, thanks. So first, um, Daryl, I'm, I'm upset with both you and Jeremy for not having our pact of all academics show up dressed like slobs. Okay, so that's a real problem. <laughs> I'll talk to both of you about it afterwards. But, but it, it's a funny, it's, a, it's kind of a weird thing when they said they were getting indemnified. I just thought, like, what, it's clearly a communications thing. They're already indemnified. Uh, there's a consolidated balance sheet. It's like the Fed has a different balance sheet than the consolidated government. So it's kind of a funny thing to make it, to state it that way. And it does seem to me, as a communications issue, almost a dangerous one because we have said to the Fed, your job is to exchange different forms of government securities for each other. Kind of very explicitly when you notice there's supply and demand differences across the yield curve. That's what they do. And if suddenly the Treasury stepped in and said, we want you to do it, I would be worried that that, that would be the bigger signal about, about their independence and who actually gets to make those decisions. Because I'm still I, upset about the tie. Yeah. It's good. Because I think the bank gets a letter from the chancellor on this, so it would require less independence or might imply less independence. But I, I think even in the pay down the treasury balance, that increases reserves. So it net net, it's the same thing. The it's government optical. is taking securities yeah. and the treasury balance and the reserves are going up. It's just a question of who's, but the, the government's balance sheet doesn't doesn't change very much. Interesting conversation. We can put Nellie in charge of uh, financial stability. <laughs> she She's already more, she in charge of financial stability. <laughs> I do think, that, I'm going to call him Priya in a second, but I do just one editorial. I do think the Fed has two instruments that the open market desk uses. The portfolio, well, I mean, that's the instrument, but then the, the, the FOMC has two instruments, that's a better way to put it, the portfolio and the interest rate. And I think what the Bank of England did was they, by having the Financial Policy Committee recommend the purchases, they made it clear, and by the bank having limited in time and amount, they made it very clear that this was a market functioning thing. And the Fed ought to think about whether at some point in time, if the functioning in the treasury market isn't going well and they're tightening monetary policy, they can pull back on QT and still raise interest rates and tighten monetary policy. So it's something, something they should, they should uh, think about. So, Priya. So I had a question, actually, but since you brought up QT, it reminds me so QE was clearly monetary policy. QT is also monetary policy. I think the market doesn't see QT as a financial 
stability route. So that's interesting. Maybe the Fed, if they think about it, I think that's something the market might actually benefit from hearing. On the Treasury point, my only point would be um, regular and predictable issuance is something I think Treasury prides itself on. I think the Treasury market has enjoys that convenience yield because we know the TBAC recommends something, the Treasury gives a quarterly refunding. If the Treasury starts acting, you know, suddenly buying back a bunch of debt, increasing supply, some of that regular and predictable issuance attribute goes away. And I wonder if that actually affects liquidity in the Treasury market because I don't know what the on the run size will look like. So I think that those are issues we could consider in terms of Treasury coming in. But my question actually was on, Andrew, you, you, you brought up the point that lending versus buying, um, or if the Fed does a lending facility, it, it, might, it might be the same as a buying facility, and lending might have less monetary policy links. But I, I mean, I, I don't only look at March 2020, but other episodes uh, of financial stability. If there's a balance sheet issue, I don't know if lending can help. Is the only place that there's balance sheet, to Beth's point, is the Fed. So maybe buying might be the only solution, or maybe it's a question for Beth. Um, is it a total balance sheet problem that the dealers have, or is it an elasticity of balance sheet? And, or is it the same thing, that we can't seem to move balance sheet from one business to another business, and is the only solution regulatory easing? So, any so, thoughts? So, I, actually, that's a great question a, and great points that you make. There's a real difference between when they're doing it purely with governments and when they're doing it, say, like crisis of 2008, when they're taking something that is not the, the crisis time stuff, lender of last resort, where you are going to take something that has some non-government risk in it and exchange government securities for it, you've actually changed the balance sheet of the country. That's a really serious thing, right? But if what you're doing is saying, I'll take your dollar bill and give you a quarter, right? In the end, we have to make sure that the regulations that we have don't force banks to think, no, I'm much better off having quarters than dollar bills. I think that's a really important thing, but it doesn't seem to me it's a really big deal because you haven't shifted anything other than the, the duration, the long-term interest rate risk from one place to another. There's no like default stuff. It's a big deal when they create safe assets out of unsafe assets, which is, which is sort of, you know, that's what I'm doing with these expanded discount window programs. That's a totally different animal. And I would just add to your last point, I think we have both an elasticity of balance sheet and size of balance sheet issue right now, because I do think the capital rules have taken us to a place where um, we are required to hold significantly more than you might think you know, uh, would be necessary had you been looking at this with the size of the economy and the size and the level of risks that the banks are under. But it's worth thinking about both. Um, but certainly the inflexibility and the seasonal inflexibility given the moment in time when things are spotted. So in particular, we all know that December is gonna be a tough time as people are closing their books but it's compounded because of the GSIB score is cited at that point in time. And so moving things away from period ends to averages helps to have a smoothing effect on some of this. Um, we'll create other issues. It'll mean you're living with those constraints every day rather than just at one point in time, but that will help with some of the elasticity issues. Great, all right. Well, that was a great panel. I think we sh um, we're already, I've already cut into your, uh, your break. Uh, so uh, thanks, thanks to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're in good shape. In good shape. We're in very good shape. We're, yeah, we're in good shape. We're in very good shape. We'll, uh, we'll come back at 4.05, so just a short break here and we'll get going. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Russ Benham. He is chairman of the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and he'll be delivering keynote remarks next. Chairman Benham was sworn in as CFTC chairman in January of this year, 
and ha had originally joined the CFTC as a commissioner in 2017. At the CFTC, Chairman Benham has focused on prioritizing customer protections, examining potential systemic market risk, the global transition away from LIBOR, and risks related to climate change. In addition, he spearheaded the effort to establish the CFTC's Market Risk Advisory Committee's Climate-Related Market Risk Subcommittee. We will reserve some time at the end of the speech for Q&A with the audience, and at this time, I'd like to please welcome Chair Benham to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I do have some slides, which uh, I hope this audience will appreciate. Um, and I was, I was just saying that um, I'm going to pivot probably from what the, the vast uh, majority of the discussion is, but today we'll talk a little bit about um, Treasury futures and the intersection we're seeing with the cash market and some recent events, as obviously I know this has been the, t the discussion of the day. Uh, but given the past few years, I really wanted to focus on some of the observations we've made at the CFTC around commodity markets, specifically around COVID, and then um, naturally with the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think a lot of interesting data and um, some facts about market resiliency and market structure that um, I think hopefully this audience will appreciate. So with that, uh, good afternoon again. It's a pleasure to join you today in person as we discuss some of the current issues facing the US Treasury market. The Russian invasion has been top of mind for most of 2022, chasing the heels of the multi-year COVID-19 pandemic and stacked with monetary and fiscal policy shifts, environmentally and geopolitically driven supply chain disruptions, and fintech growth, evolution, and failures. In March, I found myself speaking about market developments before a global audience of futures industry professionals. I was cautious but optimistic, taking cues from the past when monetary policy geopolitics and technological rifts resulted in tectonic shifts in our markets that compelled resilience and sound policymaking. It's the critically important but not always obvious interconnections within our markets that ensure our maneuverability as regulators so that we can pivot amid predictable ripples and also waves of uncertainty. At the time, the Russian invasion had already resulted in extreme volatility in many of our key markets and simultaneously record trading volume on global platforms. Fortunately, I was able to report that the derivatives markets were reacting and operating well and as anticipated given the challenging situation. Commission staff were actively monitoring compliance by exchanges, self-regulatory organizations, and intermediaries in the areas of trade processing, execution, and clearing. I emphasize that where regulatory obligations also included maintenance of appropriate margin, customer seg, and capitalization, the pillars of the US derivatives regulation, compliance must unfailingly be maintained by all. The CFTC was on highest alert, sifting through data, communicating with registered entities and market participants, and coordinating domestically and globally with our counterparts from a market resiliency and financial stability perspective. The CFTC is focused on ensuring that the derivatives markets continue to facilitate price discovery through trading in liquid, fair, and financially secure trading facilities, and critically provide a means for managing and assuming price risks. That said, I'd like to take my time to discuss recent observations regarding Treasury futures and then commodity markets. First, to start with Treasury futures, to monitor and evaluate our markets, CFTC engages in three distinct types of research, encompassing data, interpretation, and insight. First, the Division of Market Oversight produces the weekly commitment of traders, or COT, reports. These public data-focused reports provide detailed information on the aggregate holdings of major trader types. By covering most of our largest physical and financial asset classes, it represents not just information that aids the public in understanding the state of the financial world, but more generally the current state and expectations around flows of goods. As of November 1st, 2022, CFTC staff published data in 289 contract markets representing 70 commodity groups, including agriculture, petroleum and its products, natural gas and its products, electricity and metals and others. The CFTC recently introduced a new reporting platform that includes both an updated interface that simplifies the downloading of COT data and application program interface, which enables an easier automated download process. Second, CFTC staff engages in rigorous public-facing research that aids in interpreting data collected by the agency, such as that included within the COT reports, and providing analysis on how this data may inform the marketplace and our own policy efforts. 
And third, CFTC staff conduct rigorous analysis of market activity, which often includes confidential information on the activity of individual market participants. Focusing a little bit on the data and here in slide one, the CFTC closely monitors U.S. Treasury futures, a central set of contracts in U.S. markets. CFTC staff finds that the 10-year Treasury note futures contract is probably the most liquid U.S. rates product in risk-adjusted terms, followed by the 10-year on-the-run Treasuries. As illustrated by our COT data, asset managers tend to be, on a gross basis, the largest holders of 10-year Treasury note. The chart below, or here above, illustrates one example of the type of insight that our COT reports bring to the markets. With this data, we can see how asset managers change their positions over the last 10 years in the 10-year Treasury note futures as they adjusted the risk profile of their investment portfolios. Taking a closer look at these net longs, asset managers brought increased, broadly increased their Treasury futures positions starting in late 2017 and maintained this positioning until the pandemic hit in 2020. Every outstanding long position must be linked to an outstanding short position. We saw leveraged funds simultaneously hold short positions of similar magnitude to the longs of asset managers during that time period, as demonstrated again in the chart. These trends in positioning have been attributed to the large Treasury cash market issuance following the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017. Further, these net short hedge fund positions are generally understood to have been cash futures, basis trades, long cash, short future, which have been much discussed today. It's been suggested that hedge funds were likely positioned to meet asset manager demand during this period, demand that other potential arbiters, such as broker-dealers, were less willing to provide due to higher balance sheet costs, internal risk limits, and leverage constraints. For roughly the past year, we have seen asset managers once again increasing their net long position in Treasury futures. This time, however, the offsetting short positions are held by a broader group of hedge funds, dealers, and other market participants. Rigorous interpretation of these facts, understanding the interactions among these groupings, and how they relate to fund fundamental aspects of Treasury futures market liquidity and resilience is a focus of ongoing research within the Office of the Chief Economist. As part of the FSOC Hedge Fund Working Group discussion, staff economists have analyzed individual positions in futures for hedge funds and asset managers to understand the execution of strategies and the impl implications for financial stability. Staff are actively engaged in research projects on Treasury futures, including joint work between staff in both the Office of the Chief Economist and the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in using tens of millions of transaction by transaction observations to test hypotheses regarding Treasury market functioning. In internal analysis, staff have examined the activities of asset managers and leverage funds in the period leading up to and during the market stress of March 2020, coinciding with the onset of COVID-19. We find that neither of these trader groups were homogenous. Participants engaged in a variety of activities that we have analyzed and continue to analyze. For example, while some hedge funds appear to have engaged in cash futures basis trading, the positions of those funds varied and their responses to external events, such as increases in required margin, varied substantially. Investigating how the broad Treasury market cash and futures functions provide insight into CFTC perspectives on clearing of cash Treasury futures, dealers have long been central to that Treasury market. CFTC staff work highlights that the inventory of securities held by dealers has grown substantially in the last decade. The cash market itself has grown up substantially, and observers have suggested that clearing can help reduce the risk of mistimed cash flows, a risk that has grown with the size of the market and grows during times of stress. The majority of CFTC jurisdictional markets are cleared, and all listed contracts are cleared. Nonetheless, we continue to refine our rules in clearing in the swap space as we accommodate shifts such as the LIBOR transition. However, these second order issues are dwarfed by, the, dwarfed by the benefits of central clearing when it comes to risk. To dig further in, I'd like to share some additional insights from the CFTC's internal analysis in monitoring and evaluating the risk of in clear derivatives markets and the cash flows resulting from them. The market turmoil related to the global pandemic tested the resilience of the derivatives markets and the efficacy of post-financial crisis reform. The volatility in global financial markets during March and April 2020 and throughout 2022, given political issues, raised challenges for some market participants as liquidity demands rapidly rose in the face of initial margin increases and variation margin calls. 
Increases for commodity-related markets this year were most strongly concentrated in the last weeks of February and the first weeks of March, the initial period of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, they were not isolated to these weeks. With both economic and geopolitical concerns rising as we neared the end of last year, and current worries about energy supplies in the winter months of this year, margin demands have actually been elevated from September 2021 20, until now, as demonstrated in this chart above. Outside of recent months, margin increases over the past year have been primarily driven by physical commodities, often led by energy products. These increases have left margin levels now at near or high levels across all of our major asset classes, with futures and options, which include commodities, now representing a plurality of this total. However, much of the early part of this year rightly focused and continued to focus on the risk associated with volatility in physical commodity markets. Clearing shifts in more recent months have actually been more dominated by cleared interest rate products. In fact, total margin posted against our regulated interest rate positions rose by approximately $50 billion in the last few months, an increase very similar to that seen in March in futures markets. These shifts appear to have left current margin levels at conservative levels relative to recent market conditions. As the chart demonstrates, even as commodity prices have fallen over the last few months, margin posted at CFTC regulated clearinghouses remains high. This is a common feature of margin models with central counterparties working to ensure that they are adequately protected even in cases when volatility or prices rapidly shift or reverse course. These elevated trends exist at an aggregate level and at more granular product level, most notably in energy. The, graph below, the black graph below charts margin levels for five key contracts normalized against margin levels as of last October, roughly a one-year period. I want to make sure I get my contracts right. Four. There we go. Margin for all the energy contracts remains significantly higher than at the beginning of the period, even in cases like crude oil, where prices have fallen far from their recent highs. We believe that in part of this, we have observed no margin breaches over the last few months for the major contracts in our markets. However, these margin increases necessarily result in liquidity calls on both members as well as their clients. Though there is some flexibility in the types of collateral that can be posted to clearinghouses, in practice, they usually fall with two categories of high-quality instruments cash held either at the central bank or large financial institutions, or coming back to the main theme of today, sovereign bonds. As of the second quarter of 2022, the total amount of sovereigns posted at our clearinghouses exceeded $350 billion, roughly half of all forms of collateral. This puts front and center questions about the ease of access to U.S. Treasuries by derivatives market users and the cost of this access. These questions about collateral have been far from theoretical this year. Commercial end users, especially in regions most affected by physical disruptions, have expressed concerns about challenges in collateral access. In some cases, liquidity facilities have been established to aid with this flow, in part providing collateral transformation services for those with non-standard holdings. More recently, rate market movements left participants facing similar questions. For instance, when entities like pension funds face imbalanced flows as a result of hedging strategies. Here, collateral transformation aid may take a different form, switching non-cash assets to cash where payments must be made in specific currency, but the general theme often remains the same. Do entities that need access to collateral like U.S. Treasuries have that access? Through what means and how has that changed through time? One related proposal circulating among leaders is whether there is a way for CCPs and other clearing agencies serving U.S. clients to access Federal Reserve deposit accounts as a tool to lower risk in the system given the large flows of collateral, the size of CCPs, and volatility that we are seeing. We, of course, continue to dig into these questions now in light of this year's events. Recently, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, Bank for International Settlements Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, and the IOSCO published a final report on liquidity demands during the early COVID period a report that included a number of policy themes informed by comment letters from many of you listening here today. The themes covered areas such as liquidity preparedness, the predictability of liquidity demand, and the value of appropriate demand mitigants. With treasuries or other sovereign bonds representing such a notable fraction of these liquidity demands and themes, it's a market segment for which forums like these are incredibly important and for us necessary to help ensure the connections between it and derivatives remains healthy in the years to come. 
Relatedly, a current proposal would, among things, significantly increase the number of Treasury security transactions submitted for clearing at covered clearing agencies. Central clearing has been a hallmark of the futures industry for decades, and the implementation of mandatory central clearing for standardized swaps over the last decade has brought effective risk-reducing benefits. Mandatory clearing, however, has not taken effect without raising new challenges. While the market turmoil related to the global pandemic tested the resilience of the derivatives markets and the efficacy of these post-financial reforms, and today the US CCPs remain among the strongest in the world, we are continually evaluating our regulatory model and assessing opportunities to improve upon it as new challenges arrive. I commend our colleagues for their efforts and I'm happy to share our expertise from the CFTC in the future. Commodity and financial markets have been especially volatile this year with exceptional stresses resulting from the onset of an extended recovery from the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We remain in the midst of that aggression which has led to extreme uncertainty in the global markets for energy, agriculture, and metals, often leading to unanticipated movements in commodity prices because of shifting market sentiment. Any decision at any time can and could move markets in extreme ways. This is coupled with shifting monetary policy, tightening by the US Federal Reserve and other principal economies around the world, aimed at slowing inflation levels, and in doing that, resulting in macroeconomic effects on the same commodities and associated consumer and producers more generally. Price movements in these markets for those outside of this country further affected by exchange rates, with the US dollar recently rising to a 20-year high against many other currencies, putting additional upward pressure on price increases. While this trend may provide an offset to upward pressure on price increases, inflationary pressures for companies that rely on overseas sales and exports for revenues, a strong dollar environment can mean lower earnings, compounding the negative impacts of higher US rates and inflation. Supply side decisions bring us to a final factor in energy price to pressure and uncertainty with OPEC's recent decision to de decrease production by 2 million barrels per day, even while the Ukraine invasion continues having knock-on effects across all commodities. According to OECD, Russia, Russia's aggression against Ukraine has, been undermined, has undermined the latter's capacity to harvest and export crops, sunflower seed and wheat among them. Russia plays a key role in global energy and fertilizer markets, acting as the world's top exporter of natural gas and nitrogen fertilizers, and the second and third leading supplier of potassic and phosphoric fertilizers, respectively. Since the agri-food sector is highly energy intensive, the reduced export capacity and rising energy and fertilizer prices translates to higher production costs, further increasing food prices and threatening global food security. The extreme volatility in key commodities is shown in the chart below. I don't think. I have great charts, but apparently they're not going to work. <laughs> I think maybe we reached the end. Well, we'll leave it there. The extreme volatility in key commodity markets is shown in the chart below, which I do believe is this one. Yeah. Um, no, in particular, the exceptionally high prices for European natural gas, where prices in late August reached nearly four times the price levels before the invasion, while prices in the U.S. doubled from their pre-invasion levels as U.S. LNG exports to Europe increased to record levels. Obviously, being the orange line being Dutch TTF, um, and this was just an interesting observation over the past, really, two years um, about the move in, in the TTF contract versus Henry Hub, and then relative to other contracts, um, crude especially being relatively flat, and the ags also being flat. Um, CFTC staff at my direction are using every tool the agency has to ensure that commodity markets continue to fairly and transparently serve their intended price discovery and risk management function. We talk about the data for days, but in times like these, our duty is to ensure that markets are functioning properly so American consumers can be confident that they are not paying a penny extra at the pump in their homes for heating or at the grocery store. Staff have undertaken some deep dives in specific aspects of these markets, for example, if managed money traders have an undue impact on the direction of prices. Preliminary analysis across a range of asset classes shows that these traders are a heterogeneous group of traders with diverse trading strategies, and typically they roll out of contracts before the spot period, which for metals and agricultural markets is the delivery period itself. Further, their trading, the money managed trading, often lags price changes and they are more likely to provide liquidity to other traders than to take liquidity themselves. 
Proper functioning derivatives markets need liquidity providers to better absorb price spikes that ultimately harm the American consumer. As we have seen with the implementation of the position limits final rule in March of 2021, when there is sufficient liquidity in our markets, our markets continue to perform their price discovery functions by being an accurate reflection of supply and demand. During these times of volatility and geopolitical instability, farmers and ranchers and other across the agribusiness sector, as well as the energy sector, have continued to look to our markets for risk management and price discovery. In this regard, the recent speculative position limits rule has provided the CFTC with additional tools to ensure the proper functioning of the commodity markets by, among other things, expanding federal position limits to now include 16 additional agricultural, energy, and metals futures contracts of particular importance to the U.S. economy, including WTI, WTI crude oil and Henry Hub natural gas futures, and strengthening the relationship between the commission and exchanges regarding position oversight and accountability. Additionally, the rule supports risk management by, among other things, expanding the bona fide hedge exemptions for commercial end users, but not financial firms. As an example, the rule clarifies that commercial end users may now qualify for hedge exemptions for unfixed price transactions or floating price transactions, which are common in the agricultural and energy industries in which commercial end users emphasize to staff as important for effective risk management. That said, Congress enacted the position limits rule to ensure derivatives markets function as intended, meeting both price discovery and risk management purposes. I will remain vigilant to ensure our markets and CFTC rules are for, fit for purpose in achieving the goal Congress mandated. To summarize, our derivatives markets, even during the most stressful periods of this year, functioned as designed. Though highly elevated volatility does commonly result in increases in observed bid-ask spreads and res resting depth, at times increasing transaction costs, participants were able to trade in significant volumes and adjust their risk positions effectively, providing reliable price discovery for the global commodity trade. Beyond just the trading platforms, we see that the entire market system including clearing houses and clearing members, functioned well and our derivatives markets did not transmit significant risk to the broader financial system. What we have faced these last two and a half years is unprecedented with respect to the confluence of events shaping our current economy with particular emphasis on the impact of fuel shortages. The CFTC's number one responsibility is to ensure that our markets are operating fairly in an orderly fashion and free from fraud and manipulation. Collectively, we are doing the best we can in understanding the dynamics of the American consumer, understanding the dynamics of supply constraints, and understanding the very quick pivot towards a return to normal in terms of demand with a much slower supply because of labor sl supply chain constraints and geopolitical turmoil. As two 2022 comes to a close, we remain confident that our markets work well and provide an invaluable service to the U.S. economy but we constantly monitor the markets and we remain vigilant to emerging developments and risks. With shared common goals of supporting robust, resilient markets that support financial stability and stimulate growth as current external events present more persistent and pres pressing risks to our jurisdictional markets, this year's conference provides an invaluable opportunity to broadly share our, our observations. And I appreciate the opportunity to participate and look forward to an ongoing engagement. Thank you very much. I apologize if I didn't queue up the slides perfectly. It's a, it's a tough task this late in the afternoon. Um, I'm happy to talk about the slides a little, but I think they're a bit self-explanatory, and I did sort of explain uh, what the sort of dynamic is between, um, obviously, here with the asset managers and the leveraged funds and that sort of inverse relationship, both sort of supplying liquidity to each other. Um, this, I actually think, um, should be, and this might be an error, this might be instead of US, UK, and Europe, um, I think futures and options, CDS, um, uh, and something else which I might be able to look up, uh, and I apologize for that. Interest rate swaps, so um, it should be in fact CDS, futures and options, and interest rate swaps. Um, and this, you know, significant, this was, this, these, these were very clear and obvious thinking about the initial onset of COVID, um, with clearing members seeing that huge spike in IM um, and then it normalizing because of the, the shift in monetary policy. Um, and then obviously the non-bank clearing members having a direct correlation. This is a Bloomberg Commodity Index given you know, non-bank clearing members role in, 
um, in, the, in the energy and the ag space, that, that tighter correlation between the, ch uh, the change in commodity prices after the initial dip in 2020 and that demand destruction, seeing a pretty significant move upwards. Um, again, uh, just a, a, a clear demonstration of some of the challenges our, our partners in Europe are facing with natural gas and how the Dutch TTF contract has had extreme moves uh, at sometimes, you know, multiple hundreds of times higher than previous years. Uh, U.S. natural gas obviously moving pretty significantly higher, but mostly because of export demands, uh, which have helped actually ease some of the, the concerns in, in Europe, and then crude and, and wheat being relatively flat. The ag complex, and the, and the ag complex is pretty interesting to watch, um, naturally with the spikes mostly in wheat relative to, to corn and soybeans, but looking at pre-invasion prices versus today's prices, they're notwithstanding wheat, they're largely flat, if not lower than um, prices today are, not, are largely flat, if not lower than pre-invasion uh, prices. Um, and then this final chart, which I left with these five contracts, again, demonstrating the, the TTF move. So um, I hope this was uh, a bit different than what you heard today and uh, hopefully interesting. And some of the things that we're seeing uh, at the CFTC and trying to focus on certainly feel the weight of that responsibility, but we do think um, our markets are performing uh, quite well. Um, certainly having a lot of conversations with our partners across um, the globe to ensure the clearing system is, is working well. Obviously, margin demands are significant, um, but given the volatility we've seen in markets, we're seeing that correlation, which, um, you know, is unprecedented, but uh, is really just a functionality of, of the markets themselves. So I do want to give, Scott Mixon is the acting uh, office, he's the head chief economist at the CFTC, he's here today, I want to give him um, an acknowledgement, he's been a huge help to us and was a huge part of putting this speech together. Also, Raul Varma and Richard Haynes who are in clearing and division of market oversight. So uh, happy to answer any questions if I have time. I don't know if, how much I went over or not, but anyone has a question? And I'm happy not to take questions. <laughs> Thanks everyone, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chairman Benham. Uh, we have one last and final speaker of the day, Patricia Zobel. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce her to um, uh, here at the end of the conference to provide some closing remarks on the day. Patricia is the manager pro tem of the Federal Reserve's System Open Market Account, so in portfolio, and head of the markets uh, analysis, oper markets operations, monitoring and analysis area within the markets group of the New York Fed. Um, she initially joined the Fed uh, um, in 1997 in the markets group and held, held a variety of positions over her time there, including as, uh, more recently as Deputy Soma Manager. With that, Patricia, please join the stage. Thank you, Rania. Um, well, it was great to see everyone here today in person engaging in such a lively dialogue. Um, I really enjoyed it. I hope you all did too. Uh, thank you for coming. And I'm just going to share just a few reflections on the day to close us out. I know uh, you've had a full day of, of great speakers. Um, as our speakers noted, the Treasury market plays a critical role in the global financial system, and working together to promote its resilience is of essential importance. With over $600 billion in outright transactions on average each day, and even larger sums in secured financing trades, the Treasury market remains one of the deepest and most liquid markets. However, even with these impressive volumes, there have been some notable episodes of market dysfunction in the last decade. Strains in March 2020 in particular showed us that when there are extraordinary surge in flows, the market's capacity to flexibly meet the demand for intermediation may be limited. As Nelly highlighted, since the spring of this year, we have observed a decline in measures of market liquidity as market participants manage risk in a period of heightened uncertainty about the outlook and the associated volatility in prices. In this environment, the Treasury market continues to function and serve its role. But as always, we must be watchful for vulnerabilities and further the important work of promoting resilience so the Treasury market can continue to be a source of strength even during periods of high volatility. Today's conference featured an accomplished set of speakers discussing important changes underway. Ensuring that the Treasury market meets the needs of investors for decades to come is a multifaceted effort. And there has been significant progress this year, 
building an understanding of key proposals, and moving forward on specific initiatives. I think we heard today that there's been particular focus on more transparency with enhancements to the trace data and initiatives to explore greater transparency in both cash markets and opaque parts of the repo market. Building on the experience from other markets to improve transparency can foster investor confidence and promote liquidity. As discussed in the second panel, there's been an exploration of ways to improve resilience of intermediation, including a study of all-to-all -all trading led by the New York Fed and proposals by the SEC to enhance oversight of intermediaries and trading venues, as discussed by Chair Gensler. And finally, there's been significant attention to enhancing the market infrastructure through recently published TMPG study on clearing and settlement risks, as well as the SEC's proposal to expand central clearing, which elicited a thoughtful discussion today. We understand that there is still so much work to be done. With continued engagement from the industry, official sector, and public, I'm confident that recent progress will continue, and I look forward to what next year's Treasury Market Conference brings. I'd like to conclude by thanking the Interagency Working Group for bringing us together and the speakers for their robust and thoughtful discussion. A particular thank you to the MCs of this event, Ronya and Brian, and to all the staff that helped organize, and that includes Leon Barker, Monica Scheid, John Chatty, and Ella Korea Gole. And that brings our today's conference to a close. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope those of you here in person can join us for a reception on the first floor. Thank you.